Good evening and welcome to the Norwich School Committee meeting of Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. Uh, first order of business tonight is approval of minutes. We do have three sets of minutes to approve. Um, the first is from our business meeting on November 5th. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dave. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Let's approve 5 0. Um, and then we do have two sets of executive session minutes. Um, the first is from October 21st, and the second is from November 5th. Is there a motion to approve those executive session minutes? <laughs> Thanks, Anne Marie. Dave, was that a second? Happy second. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, do we have any correspondence this evening? Uh, we do not at this time, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dave Catania, could you please read the warrant report you signed for us? Absolutely. Uh, signed warrants in the amounts of uh, $37,607.23, $37,161.80, $1,505.81, $54,187.84, $5,291.83, $5,292.83, $6,323.32, for a grand total of $922,513.15. Thank you, Dave. Any questions on the warrants from the committee? I'm sorry, is that the correct warrant? Or am I looking at the wrong one if I pull up the warrants for November 18? Um, I have one that says a total of 270000 I read the wrong one. So my apologies. Okay. Let me find that one. Hang on. I want to make sure I was looking at the right one. <laughs> yeah. I was Thank like, you, Mary, for that. Sound familiar, but they are blending all together. Hang on. It's linked in the packet too, Dave, if you have the agenda. Ah, that would help. I am so embarrassed. My apologies. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's attached to Anne-Marie. Thank you. Don't worry, Dave. <laughs> Normally I print copies, but I'm trying to save some paper here, you know. So ah, that's better. That's more like it. Sorry to panic, everybody. No, Here we go again. I'd like to read the warrant report to us this evening. <laughs> Delete that for the rolls. Um, here we go. Warranty in the amounts of fifty-nine thousand twelve $12,96, $2,641.54, $2,264.58, $5,665.24, $5,265.28, $4,557.99, $33,948.50, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99, $4,557.99,
or incorrect use of pronouns, which does not reflect the student's gender identity. With everything that the schools must face in the midst of the current pandemic, I am so thankful to see this step forward. Thank you for your hard work and caring for our children. With appreciation, Jenny Wu, mother to a student at the Callahan Elementary. I'm just gonna refresh this email address to see if anything else came in for public forum. I do not see anything else. So at this time at 7.08, um, I will declare a public forum tonight closed. Okay, that brings us along to our appearances. We do have a number of appearances this evening. First on our agenda is Mr. Riccardi to give us a, a joint facilities um, update. Um, Mr. Riccardi, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, I'm here with Chris Follin. Um, so let me just uh, tell you that the town-wide facilities was officially kicked off July 15th uh, this summer. It actually started the third week of June because we had a uh, catastrophic failure of the cooling tower at the town hall. They had no air conditioning. Uh, we had some issues at the fire and police department with their HVAC system and some issues at the printing building uh, that the town owes, that owns that's uh, a couple of lots down from the town hall. So we actually jumped in in the middle of June. Um, but I can tell you, uh, and I wanna just spend a little time and then Chris is gonna spend some time. I just wanna go over um, the staffing of this organization because um, we really haven't added very many staff. So I'm the director. Chris, who was the general foreman for the schools, buildings, and grounds, is the assistant director. Maureen Heffernan, who was the administrative assistant for buildings and grounds, is the business manager for the town-wide facilities. Um, we then added a replacement uh, for Chris, who was obviously the general foreman and electrician. Um, in the electrician role, we were lucky to be able to hire Paul Campbell, who um, is not only an electrician, but he handles all security, fire alarms, and uh, video surveillance. So he's a, an important factor going forward with our, in our organization. We we're also lucky enough um, to hire uh, Stevie Eckhart. Uh, he was worked for Jacobs Plumbing and uh, for, I don't know, 40 years. And he primarily was in all the town buildings, including the schools. So he came over um, in July and he brought with him the knowledge of the town buildings an intimate knowledge of the town site, which uh, Chris and myself did not have. So he's a great asset. Um, we were also fortunate enough. Um, and those are actually the only two positions that were kind of added, but Jacobs Plumbing, um, we had money for a contract from them. That money just moves over to fund Stevie and um, Paul Campbell was a, re a replacement position. Um, so Chris was a new position. Um, we also were fortunate enough to negotiate with Tony Mizuko and Mark Ryan that the DPW took over total uh, care and prep of the athletic fields. So in the spring and in the fall, very busy times, the, the DPW would do the first uh, go around and get the fields ready, then our guys would go in and do the final groom and the lining of the fields. So took up a lot of time in the fall and in the spring. Given that the town was uh, gracious enough to take that over, we could, with our existing people, um, do a little reorganization. So we took our three grounds people and made them unlicensed craftsmen. Um, and they are supporting the licensed craftsmen and the electrician, plumber, carpenter, and uh, locksmith. So uh, without that, uh, I think we would have been down some hours of labor that would drastically needed to pick up the uh, the whole the size of the town. We we actually doubled our square footage in buildings that were taken care of. We're up over a million four square feet, um, and the town has about eleven buildings. Um, so. I mean, and it's kudos. I, I just want to take the time to name these guys. Obviously, Paul Campbell, electrician. Stevie Eckhart is the uh, plumber. Um, Fernando Els and Jimmy Morrison are the carpenter slash locksmith. They're both locksmiths. And we've got uh, 
Richie Bassomian, Larry Fry, and Bob Bejan, who are the unlicensed craftsmen who support um, the licensed guys, as I said before, and do everything and anything. And um, Chris is going to get into more of what what's transpired since we took over. But I'm going to just steal a little of his thunder because he always says in all of the meetings that he would put this team of uh, tradesmen up against any team, both public or private. And if you walk through, obviously, our schools uh, and we're starting to make an impact on the town buildings, they are in, in incredibly good shape. Um, and it's a tribute to these guys. And this was done. It could have been. Uh, a lot of issues as you take a bunch of guys who had a job doing X and now you're asking them to do X and Y and you know you're not really the rewards weren't all that high um, in financially but they stepped up and they've done it and it's still what I would consider a very happy uh, group of people doing this work um, you also need to know that Besides our regular work, the town was a designated green community and the town got a $180,000 grant uh, to do um, a, a lot of work in all town buildings. And the committee basically chose uh, low hanging fruit, LED lighting, um, and we were able to change 340 corridor lights at the high school this summer to LEDs. We bought them uh, four years ago through Mass Save. We got an unbelievable price, but we never had the manpower and or the time to do it. So that was done this year. They're now in public safety and we've done the library. And I just want to reiterate that nobody, as far as I'm concerned, has missed a beat. Not one school building has missed a beat. We are, we are doing our work orders in uh, 24 hours. Uh, on average, and the town is seeing a tremendous increase in the service that uh, they're getting, which they never had before. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Fulham. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So that's a tough act to follow, um, Mr. Riccardi. Uh, uh, like Paul said, yeah, we are a, a, a good group, um, and everybody is happy um, as long as everything gets done the way I want it done. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'd, I'd be lying to you if, you, if I didn't tell you that um, the, the real driver of our train here in the uh, facilities department is Maureen Heffernan, without question. Uh, Maureen is the glue that holds this whole thing together for us. So um, that's the facts. Um, before, um, I'll, I'm just going to go through a list that I put together of um, some of the bullet things, uh, bullet points for uh, what the guys have done through the spring and summer um, for COVID and into the fall. Uh, changes in the schools that were necessary. But on top of the maintenance guys that Paul just mentioned, it would be uh, unfair really to say the least that uh, we didn't mention the custodians in every building. And uh, not only the school buildings, but over the past few months, uh, meeting some of the custodians in the town buildings. Um, it's really a good group of guys. And it's amazing how all our guys have kind of get together and blended together and everybody's working together as, as one. Uh, and it's really working great. So those guys haven't skipped a beat. Um, uh, it's very hard for a custodian to work from home, as you all know. So they've been there in those schools, um, cleaning, painting all summer long. I mean, stripping floors and painting. We spent probably half a million dollars on paint, it seems, uh, this summer. We ran Home Depot a few times, and the buildings show it. So kudos to those guys. And also the uh, the cafeteria workers. Those women, um, man, we were down there helping those guys out whenever we could in uh, and of course, we got rewarded for that. We won't get into that too much. I don't know the nice things that the cafeteria ladies made us for breakfast and lunch sometimes. But anyways, um, so with that, um, I'll go into some of the things that we did. Um, right at the outset, we replaced um, all the water bubblers. We shut off every water bubbler in every school. And we replaced them um, in kind of areas that the, pin the principals picked with our water bottle fillers. We did that in all the schools right at the outset. Um, for obvious reasons. We took all the momentary faucets that were primarily in the elementary schools. We just pushed the faucet on and stayed on for a couple of seconds, went off, and we put in the faucets that you could turn on and leave on so we could get the the, uh, the warm water for, uh, for the kids to wash their hands and stuff. Yeah. Um, all the intercom systems were tested and repaired, which we had to do anyways, absent COVID, but um, we were able to get that all done. Uh, we repaired uh, windows 
in all the schools and classrooms where it was needed, uh, obviously for the ventilation stuff. We did PM work on every exhaust fan that we have, every school, every roof. Uh, some of them needed belts, some of them needed motors. We get all that stuff done and working. All the uh, filters and all the unit vents and classrooms and everything were uh, replaced. Uh, three of the schools, we put hot, new hot water tanks in. We're getting up there in age. And uh, the one at the Coakley failed completely. And that is, I don't even know how to describe how big that is. I think it was, um, it takes up the garage. It stands up in the garage. Um, so uh, we were able to do a little bit different uh, replacement for that with a uh, high efficiency one. So that was good. Uh, in the Callahan School, we relocated the library and the SPED office, which um, doesn't seem like much, but um, there was 3,000 books if there was one. And it went from what was the old trailer down into the basement part in the front of the school and the teachers that were down there moved up. So that was quite a move. Uh, and then we installed office petitions to make three offices in that area for the teachers. Several of the schools had smart boards that had to be moved, obviously, for the remote learning stuff. Uh, a lot of the teachers moved uh, classrooms, desks, cabinets, all that stuff. We put signs up in all the schools where we needed for proper hand washing techniques, uh, signs for uh, social distancing, arrows on the floors in all the schools. Um, PPE was delivered here, there, and everywhere over and over and over again. I, I know some of you saw uh, Dr. Thompson, especially what Paul's office was like. Um, we, we should have probably had an armed guard outside that office for the amount of PPE that was in there and the value of it. Um, so that stuff was all done. We helped uh, Jill Driscoll and her team get all that, uh, the nurses stuff all sorted out and delivered to the schools uh, before everything opened up. Um, we did in some of, if not all of them, Paul can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we had to create isolation areas in the schools for if there was a possible um, uh, child or student that came down uh, with, the, with the COVID. Hundreds and hundreds of desks had to be moved. I think in the high school alone, they had to take the desks out of the classrooms to get down to the amount of kids, for, and they moved them up to the walking track. So I can't even tell you how many desks at the high school got moved over um, over the summer, uh, but there was hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, so that's uh, basically what we did in the school buildings. There are some other things, obviously, that uh, were day-to-day -day maintenance, uh, routine things that we had to do, but the long of it is that. Um, the guys are very busy, the custodians are very busy, and all in all, things are going great. So um, like I said, and like Paul said, I don't think that um, we've um, skipped a beat with the service in all the buildings. Thank you, Mr. Fall, and thank you, Mr. Hardy. Um, I know we have consistently been proud and impressed of our facilities department, um, and we continue to be. I think I speak for everybody when I say that, um, but that, list of responsibilities that you just read um, is long. Uh, it required, I know, a lot of collaboration with other departments. So um, I really appreciate everything that you all do. Um, are there other questions or comments from the committee? Maya? Um, thank you. Uh, I'm thrilled that the Joint Facilities Department is off to such a good start. Um, before this meeting, I was reviewing the MOU that we had signed um, with the Board of Selectmen to, to set up this joint facilities um, group. And I think that uh, one of the things we said was that we would revisit this annually. So I think we're due to um, sit down again with, um, with uh, the Board of Selectmen and, and of course with with Paul Riccardi and, and other people and just make sure that we're all on the same page for um, how we're moving forward with this next phase. Um, as I, I know the school committee knows, but maybe not everybody knows that um, this year we didn't really move any budget money um, around, but that um, starting in FY22, which um, we are really gonna be starting to build that budget start. I mean, that budget process starts next month um, we will be um, moving the the facilities money out of the school budget and into a new facilities budget. So um, I think there's a little bit of work to be done there, but mm -hmm. I'm very optimistic that that's going to go well, and I'm I'm thrilled that this is moving along. Yeah. Maya, would you consider the need for that meeting to be something facilitated through the BBC or? Well, we did have that um, joint facilities um, like working group. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe we should um, should go through that. Um, yeah. 
Okay. We, we could, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know exactly how we want to handle that. We didn't, we didn't work that detail out in right. the, um, in the MOU itself, but, um, but I do know that we had said we wanted to make sure that we talked again, just to make sure that we all were, we, you know, it, we expected that there might be something that came up this year that we realized, oh, we should have put that in writing. And so, um, I think it's time for us to, to start scheduling a meeting to talk about that. It's not something that's like, you know, urgent all needs to be wrapped up next month, but, okay. but just something for us to start thinking about. Absolutely. Other questions or comments for Paul and Chris? Uh, just many thanks. One heck of a job you guys are doing. Really appreciate it. And that's an understatement. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the one thing I forgot to tell you is uh, the facilities department will be moving down to 206 Central Street, the old light department on the second floor. Um, and I think it's really timely because Dave is starting to get uh, chased around the Savage Center for people who departments that need more space. So we're moving out so we can watch Dave make the impossible decision who's <laughs> going to get our two offices. So. Uh, we, we hope to be out, uh, we first said before Thanksgiving, we're saying maybe before Christmas, but probably by the first of the year. Okay. We're going to go with lottery. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, it's going to be a big lottery. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Lottery just popped up. I just have a question. Maybe I could ask, um, what, I'm going to be promising and hoping that we stay in school. Um, through the winter and um, we have winter sports. Maya, I hope to see you at the hockey rink. Um, but a question on snow, as we all know, snow and storms are gonna be coming. Um, with the Chromebooks and remote learning, and one of my duties is running the snowstorms and uh, talking to Dr. Thompson and in godly hours in the morning about school or no school. So at some points during those nights, early mornings, um, we really feel the rush, the push to get, uh, as do the DPW guys and the contractors that work for us, to get those final walkways done, parking lots done, roadways done. And if there's gonna be more of a thought going into the remote uh, during snowstorm time, um, it'd be very helpful across the board. So I'm yeah, not sure there hasn't been discussion yet, but. Yeah, we, we, uh, we do have the ability and we are planning that if the weather is bad, where we would not want people transferring, we can go all remote. Uh, the one caveat the Department of Education has uh, given us is that everyone must still have power and internet access. So um, unless that changes, and of course we have the world's greatest uh, power and light and internet company. Um, so I don't foresee that being a huge issue. So we're, we're planning on very little, if not zero snow days, they would be remote only days. So. So, so one other thing, can I jump the gun and congratulate Teresa, Dave, and Alan Slater on their work with the MSBA and uh, the outcome of uh, AI3 uh, going to uh, do the feasibility study and, and design our new uh, Coakley Middle School. So uh, it's a great team that you guys have put together. So congratulations. Thank you, Paul. But you know, you are part of that team. Yeah, um, no, but I wasn't so, there. For you know, you're going to be joining us in many meetings. So. You're probably angling for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we will talk about the middle school in more detail later on tonight. But thank you, Paul. Okay. All right. Anything on facilities from any from everybody? All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. See you uh, at the rink, Maya. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. So moving along to our next appearance, uh, we do have Miss Reese and Miss Bishop to join us again. At this point, I think you ladies are just honorary school committee members. Um, <laughs> so thank you for taking time to be with us. Um, I know we have some important updates to discuss since, uh, what was it, 12 hours after we last met, the state changed the metrics on us at all. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Another big change today, but it doesn't really affect the uh, any of these policies. But yep, things are constantly changing, but we're we're rolling with it. Yeah. 
Um, appreciate you guys having us again. No, we're happy to have both of you with us. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Sagal and Kathy, um, to provide the update and guide us through the discussion tonight. Sure. We've sort of fell into a pattern here. So I'll start, um, again, just sharing the data. Um, so we can go over that real quick. And then I have, um, I also shared a, um, a Word document. Um, I hope you have other packets there, um, which outlines a lot of what, you know, I hope we could discuss today. Yeah. Um, but first, I'll just do a quick roll through the data. And they do have the document, um, Sagal. They Great. had it yesterday, so they have that. Um, so like Teresa said, they, um, the metrics were changed. Um, this is the new uh, color coding metric system. They, um, they divided it up by population size. I actually think that this is moving in a good direction. It was just the way it was presented that was presented a difficulty for us because it, we had no um, heads up that it was coming. Um, so we obviously fall into the population size between 10 to 50,000. So we are in that middle column. Um, so in addition to the average case count per 100,000, they also take into account the percent positive. Um, so like I said, taking in multiple metrics to really characterize what's going on, on the ground is a good thing. So I think this is actually um, advantageous for everybody to better describe the situation. Um, so the report that uh, this is what I assume the report will have that comes out uh, tomorrow night. It might be different by one or two cases, depending on the timing of when the state pulls the numbers to when I pull the numbers. Um, but it will be within this range. So um, from the 1st to the 14th, we had uh, 95 cases, uh, which gives us a rate of about 22.5 per 100,000. The percent positive um, has been climbing. And it was last week, it was 2.92. Uh, and this week, it, um, it should be around 3.23. So that is going up, um, unfortunately. And what that really means is that our testing capacity is not keeping up with um, the increase in cases. So you can have an increase in cases, but obviously you want your testing to increase too, so that your percent positive stays low. Um, three is still, you know, still low, and they've sort of drawn the threshold at five. Um, so if we have, you know, our case count keep rising and our percent positivity keeps rising, we will we will reach that red category. Um, but I think we're still a ways away from that. Again, um, similar to last time when we talked about it, no large clusters, mostly household clusters, mix of different exposures. Um, no one thing I can really tell you to not do or do differently. It's um, workplace social exposures. We have some travel cases um, that would turn positive after travel. We do what is different um, this week. We do have one cluster in one long-term care facility. And I think that reflects a little in our age um, spread there. That You see that the age range from four to 96. We, had, um, we are starting to see cases in older adults, which um, we haven't seen in a while. And, and obviously that's unfortunate because that's where we do see more severe disease. The average is still pretty low at 47 and this is for that two week period um so focusing on the data with the students um over the two week period we had 12 students um only three of those are currently active the rest have all finished their isolation um, which i think is important when we talk about how we report these later um, to sort of describe the difference between number of cases and number of active cases um, we continue to see no school transmission um, one of those cases had close contacts in the school, um, and that, that case is still in isolation, and those contacts are still in quarantine. Um, so we don't know if they'll convert yet. Um, and a lot of this, um, some of our cases were, were travel. Some of those cases were actually in the remote learning, so obviously no exposure in the school. Um, and that I think we only had, so we had so few close contacts. Again, we talk about because of the hybrid model, because the, most of the kids only being school two days a week, the chances of them being in school during their infectious period are low. Um, so that's you know what's been working with the hybrid to keep those close contact numbers down. And all the cases, those 12 cases, were from exposures outside of the school setting from different activities. Um, and you see the age breakdown, it's a little more um, spread, spread out. We really, for I would say the last two, three months, we're seeing um, 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 year olds that's where most of our cases are. And you can sort of hear, see here that it's spread out a little more with those older cases um, now adding to the group, unfortunately. So really what we're here to talk about is maybe is two policy changes. Um, the first one being changes to the notification system. Um, I worry that uh, with every email going out, um, people are gonna start to um, get numb to it and not really listen when an important email is coming out that might affect their child's classroom because there's so many emails going out. I think we want to be transparent. We all have that goal. 
um, but we also don't want to do too much notification where people just don't pay attention anymore. So what we were suggesting is, um, so when there's a case, the uh, individual classroom or activity, the bus or the, the sports team will still get a email saying, you know, an individual in your classroom has tested positive for COVID, Dr. Thompson's typical email that he sends out. So those would still go out with every case, but the district-wide notifications, we're still wondering if we could do that on a weekly basis with, with a summary of activities. And then as a health department, we'd commit to updating a, um, a chart on our website. Um, I would say daily, but as cases come in. So as we get a case, we'll update the chart. Cases, school age cases don't come in every day, but we would keep that up to date. And I sort of um, put a template on the, the document um, that was shared with you of what, you know, I can imagine what it looks like. Uh, go ahead. Do I have to call on you? I was going no, that's okay. I'm, I'm kind of interrupting. Yeah, I send the general notification, the, uh, the classroom bus, those sort of notifications come from the principal. Uh, at the building level, just because of the communication uh, piece and how we arrange that, just to be just to be clear. So I would, under this plan, send out that message. Uh, there would be a link to an ongoing count, um, but that would go out kind of weekly, maybe on a Thursday. I'm thinking, but that's that's right. Do, okay, thank thanks, you. Thanks for that correction. That's that's a good point um, on who the who the information is coming from is is important and how how parents our families receive that. Okay. Um, so I think we'd give some time for notice. You know, we, we don't want to do a switch without getting the word out there. So we were saying if, if everybody's in agreement, we can implement it maybe on the week of the 23rd. Are there any questions or concerns with this change from the school committee? Everyone's shaking their head no. So I think it's okay if we make this change. <laughs> Great. And you have had a chance to share it also with the Board of Health, correct? Yes. Okay. Kathy, I don't know if you wanted. Oh, Kathy, you're still muted. The board's already been notified. They have the whole plan, the same as the um, school committee got. Okay, perfect. So then Dr. Thompson will continue, well, maybe not, maybe there's no more cases, but if there's cases tomorrow or Friday, he will continue to notify in the way that he has been, but then starting on Monday, we will shift to this um, weekly district-wide communication. Okay. And then um, the last big discussion point was really what we talked about at our last meeting was creating um, sort of a guideline on how we would pivot um, from remote to hybrid and then back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, what we brainstormed about was creating a stepped process that would really help guide the decisions, but I really want to stress that um, every situation is different, every COVID case is different, every exposure is different, and that we want some flexibility in it to be able to um, make decisions based on what's going on on the ground, um, whether it be move through the steps quickly or move through the steps slowly, depending on the situation. Um, I describe it as, you know, step one is where we are now. We have school age cases, but we're not seeing transmission in the school. We have adequate staffing numbers. There's really no, no change required where we talk about sort of staying status quo. Step two is um, if any of those close contacts do, um, if, if I'm sorry, if we identify close contacts, which, you know, through these two week reports, I would say um, we have one to two cases where we identify close contacts. Um, so it does happen. That sort of puts us in step two, I'd call it like an awareness stage. Um, we still are not seeing in-school transmission because it's just identifying close contacts. It doesn't mean they've become cases. And again, we have ad adequate staff. So I would say it's an awareness. I want to make sure the superintendent knows that we have those close contacts identified and that we're watching those. Step three, we have not gotten to this point yet. And that's when we would see any of those close contacts um, convert into cases. And that's what we would call in-school transmission. Um, so let's deal with the first point, the first bullet point first. Um, so at that point, we might advise and work with the, the superintendent would make the call, but we would um, talk about pivoting either that classroom or whoever was affected by that case and that transmission, pivot that area or classroom to, uh, to remote until we are able to fully contact trace, isolate and quarantine and ensure there's no additional cases. And then you would sort of go back to step one and two in that classroom or area. The other scenario that we envisioned happening was if you had a significant number of staff, um, you know, teachers and other staff out that you might need to pivot a classroom. 
to um, to fully remote. And we would follow the same sort of once those cases are resolved and we know that there's no more transmission and everything was sort of tied up and all the quarantines were completed, we, we could transition that back back into in-person or, or the hybrid. Um, the one thing too, if we do see school in-school transmission, we can talk to the state and request um, the testing in the school. And this is that PCR testing. This is the diagnostic testing that the state has offered in schools um, if there is in-school transmission. So they would come in and test the whole school. So that would really help us identify any additional cases um, and any transmission going on in that building. And then step four, which I hope we never get to, is when we're seeing a lot of close contacts, a lot of school in-school transmission to multiple schools, you know, significant number of staff reductions. And that's when I think it, you know, come to the school committee and we'd all be having a conversation about the whole district um, going fully remote. Hope we never have to get to step four. <laughs> but I do anticipate that, um, you know, we, we will hit step three at some point. Um, it's, you know, we have this virus in our community. It's, it's um, transmitting between people. And I would expect the same thing to happen in the schools. I think because of the hybrid model and because the schools have been doing um, such a good job with the um, safety standards. That's why we continue to see a low number of close contacts, if any, um, with our cases. And I also wanted to stress, you know, I don't think it's an exact correlation, but I have noticed that the number of cases we have, the uh, it's about, you know, 18 to 20 percent of our total cases. And if you look at the population breakdown of NORD, school aged children are about 20 percent of our population. Um, you know, so I don't know if that's an exact correlation, but it seems to be what I would expect about that amount of, of school aged children to have COVID because the virus is just circulating around. So it's not like we have an extraordinary amount of school aged children with, with COVID. Thank you, Sagal. Um, questions, concerns around pivoting between the two models and these four steps? <laughs> Anne-Marie? I did have one question, uh, actually just thinking about the um, the notification um, or procedure that we have. Has any thought been given to not sending out an email when it's strictly in the RLA? Or if there was um, a case that uh, happened when the infectious period was outside of the classroom? Because I feel like I hear most from parents saying, you know, it's kind of funny, I got this email, we panic, and then it was an RLA student who didn't come into contact with anybody in the schools anyway. So is there, I don't know if that's something we've given thought to that is it really necessary to send an email about um, a COVID case quote in the schools if it was not a, kid, a child that was ever actually in the schools. And that could be the hybrid kids too. I mean, they're out of the, the classroom for, you know, if you're on a Wednesday through Sunday, you know, five full days that you weren't even in the classroom and I just feel like that's what I hear most from some of the parents and where some of that you know email notification fatigue is coming in yeah well we do we do have to notify the department of elementary and secondary education of all of our students and then they determine based on when they were in school whether they reported or not so and they usually ask were they in school for the last week which I'm not quite sure why that makes sense or not but um so my concern is if we don't notify people or at least keep count and track of that, our numbers with the state might look vastly different. And then we get into a, how come you didn't tell us this? And I've actually seen it occurring in other communities that maybe don't communicate as well as we do. And there is a difference in numbers when they do communicate and they're asking that particular district why they don't, they're not telling everybody in why they're not reporting cases. So there is a lot of confusion with the reporting to the state and how that comes out. Um, and I'd rather, you know, have the state numbers be lower than ours, to be honest with you, but that's, you know. And I suppose with, you know, doing a weekly digest type of thing, you know, it's, right. it won't be as fatiguing, but yeah, just. Right. Well, Hopefully, it, yeah, and I'm actually gonna come back to this, you know, in, in the superintendent's report, but hopefully people are realizing that the way we have built our system is to reduce the kind of transmission that could possibly happen. And, and that wasn't by accident, that was purposeful. That was purpose, I need more sleep. That was on purpose. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do this to, to limit, you know, cohort changes and, and, and contact between groups and, and time 
away and separated so that that could not happen. Hopefully people were getting that from it, but I agree the fatigue problem is including the superintendent's fatigue from doing at least one method every single day for the last uh, four weeks. Um, you know, it, it definitely is there. And I think that point is loud and clear just as uh, yeah. that most of the ones that have come out, I would say a majority are not, you know, in the schools. This is somebody who had, we had to go contact trace. I think a majority of them been RLA or they were in their hybrid um, at home portion. And I think that definitely is resonated with a lot of the parents. So call, is it a way when you're tracking, I don't know if like the data you already have, if this is possible, um, like with the template that you showed us, it's going to go on the website. Could we have a fourth row that is RLA kids or is that not possible with the exchange of communication? No, yeah, we could say, well, there's RLA and then there's also was not in school during their infectious period mm -hmm. right. probably because of the hybrid schedule or mm -hmm you know, or they were traveling or they were already in quarantine. Like there could be a lot of reasons why they weren't in school during their infectious period. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things. So one, I just, I, I could definitely add that. We could definitely add the student with an RLA or in the case count, um, create a different category that's just RLA, mm -hmm. um, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, and RLA as a general category. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it it's a very different message when you say there's a school age child, but, but they were not in school during an infectious period, and maybe the the individual notifications, and this is something we didn't really discuss, so it's brand new to everybody here. We we just say we could send out the individual notifications if the classroom was affected, not if there was just a, a child in that classroom, but if the classroom was exposed, mm -hmm. quote unquote. You know, we, there might or might not be close contacts, but if the person wasn't in, in that classroom during their infectious period a notification goes out as collected in the weekly report as opposed to right going out if that child a child in that classroom even though they weren't in the classroom during their infectious period right mm -hmm. now currently that would still go out with what we're proposing right yeah so uh, again thinking off the top of my head here since we didn't talk mm -hmm. about this in that smaller working group of Seagal and Stacy and, and Dave and I um you see pros and cons to that um I, I see and I hear a lot of people talking about like what is a close contact and and how are you telling me that all these cases that you know happen with the child in the hybrid model really did not have a close contact in the school and I trust your department 100% Seagal I'm not doubting you at all but I think just to help the community understand that you know through your contact tracing through your interview process with the teacher with the school nurse like if you have identified there really is no close contact there is no close contact but i would just want to be mindful that we still stay transparent in our communication and that we don't change so many things at once that it now looks like are we trying to not put that information out there um and i also think there's some families who really do want to know is there a case in my child's physical classroom even if it didn't happen, you know, in that 48 hour window and that there's not a close contact, but just some families may want to be more vigilant or take their own precautions, just knowing that somebody was physically in their classroom. But that's just how I'm going to There's two things. I, I'm sorry if I could clarify. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, one thing, whether because they could be in school during their um, infectious period and no close contacts be identified. I was suggesting if they were not even in school, like there was no exposure, whether they were already out in quarantine or they hadn't been in school for a week mm -hmm. um, or because of the hybrid, those two days before their test, um, they weren't in school. So there would be no chance of close contacts. But if they were in school during their infectious period and no <laughs> close contacts were identified, because that can happen if the safety standards are followed very closely, then I do agree. I think a notification should go out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then then I think we all agree a notification should go out. And it's it's that gray area of they're in the classroom, but they weren't in the classroom in their infectious period. So there's no chance of exposure to anybody. We do want to give that information. Do we need to do it immediately to that specific group or to the district on a weekly report? I think, right, that's what we're debating. Okay, okay. And I think fine with either. Okay, I think uh, Joan and then Maya. Have, um, Joan? I'm, I'm going to pass because I'll take us in a different direction. So go ahead, Maya. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think that Teresa's maybe right that we should kind of make small changes. And so I'm totally in favor of doing a weekly report, but I think that 
um, it's reassuring to people to get an email that says like, yes, one of your students' classmates, um, you know, has been diagnosed, but they were not in school during their infectious period or something like that. Because I think, um, you know, if you're looking district wide, you're not necessarily going to hear about what goes on. But I think, you know, families talk and things happen and you're going to hear a rumor like, oh, did you hear that Susie had it? And, and they're like, I didn't add anything, notification. I Did they actually check? Did anybody know? And like, I just think it's reassuring for families to be able to get an email that says like, we are aware, obviously it doesn't include Susie's name, but you know, we are aware that there was a case in your student's class. We have investigated. This person was not in the room during their, you know, infectious period. And there are, you know, therefore there are no school contacts. And, you know, that I think, for now, um, and maybe we get to a point where we feel like even that's too much, but I think um, that could be like a nice transition. Uh -huh. And just, and, and I, I, I think I, I get your point and I think I agree, but one, one thing to add to that is we're doing community contact tracing too. So there might be um, transmission from that student in outside activities, which we have seen close contacts identified from activities outside of the school, which, mm -hmm. sort, which course, yeah. integrates into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Joan, did you want to share your thoughts? Um, uh, again, I'm taking us in a different direction, so I just want to make sure that so you know, all good. Is everybody, <laughs> so, Sagal, can you just recap what you think the changes are at this point after the discussion? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Sure. If we have a positive case of a school aged child, a notification will go out to that classroom or area, but you know, activity. Um, regardless of whether they were in school or not during their infectious period. Um, but the district-wide emails will be restricted to one email, uh, one email a week summarizing everything. And then mm -hmm. the, uh, the health department will keep an updated chart on our website of um, all the school age cases, the, the students that go to public school. And you will update that weekly on the website? Um, I, I can commit to updating it as cases come in. Um, it will okay. probably be daily to every other day. Some days we get two cases, some days we get none. So I will update it as cases come in. Okay. And Dr. Thompson, we can have a link on our school district website that takes people directly to what Seagal is creating on the health department. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to know, you know, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, what the case numbers are, they can go and they can see that, but they don't necessarily have to get a phone call at one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And the other change is that we were all add RLA to that chart. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Everybody good with that at this time. Okay. Now, Joan. <laughs> okay. So I'm also good with the notifications. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to talk about um, the the steps, step one, step two, step three. Step, I don't know why I, I felt the need to say those, but I think um, I'd like to talk about specifically if we get to um, the need to close a entire school. Um, and so that's not specifically laid out in there. And I'm wondering if that should be part of a school committee decision um, versus an individual classroom, which it makes sense to me that that's at the superintendent's discretion with um, the advice of, of Seagal. So I'm wondering, I, I guess I'm, at, I'm, I'm musing out loud that I would like to, for us to discuss whether or not the school committee should be involved in an entire school closing as a result of um, in-school transmissions. I don't have a problem with the criteria. I have a problem with getting involved. Yeah. So essentially adding a step, right? Like having in between the classroom and the district, like a school. A half a step. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like um, that's something. Yeah. The problem with involving school committee with that is that you would need to drop whatever you are doing and have a meeting right away because that is that would need to be a decision that's made pretty quickly as opposed to a district wide trend that we're seeing. Um, you know, I'm hoping that we don't need to do that, but I also will will remind the committee that the superintendent closes school when there's snow coming, you know, once upon a time in a normal <laughs> period of time. Um, you know, obviously I would inform the committee about that. It would be in consult with the health department and, and, and Seagal, but yeah, I mean, you know, that it, we could be in a situation where on a Tuesday afternoon have to make that call. And if we're closing a whole school or even a classroom, we need to be able to notify families ahead of time. So it's just a it's just a timing thing. I think not that I don't want the school committee involved, but, you know, it's um, 
going to be cumbersome and, and slow to react if we have to go to the full body. If if this is truly a timing issue, then I'd like for us to set some more parameters around what would constitute a school, an entire school closing. Um, I'd like for that to be a little bit more specified than what is currently listed. Right. Well, one of the unless other people want to push back and are able and willing to drop everything when Dr. Right. Thompson calls and says we're having a school committee meeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not yeah. in that boat, so I won't advocate for that. <laughs> yeah. Most of most of those thus far, fingers crossed, have been because of staffing issues. Mm -hmm. that, that we've seen across the state at this point in time. You have staffing member, you, ha you don't have enough teachers to run the classrooms uh, because they're quarantined or some are sick or most of it has been they're quarantined. So we you know, have closed the school, but we have, are designed to do is to pivot to remote. Um, and hopefully we will be able to, uh, to do that. So when we say close the school, we're not talking and even you know, closing the district. We're not talking about not having school. We're talking about not having in-person school because either staff or students are not able to leave quarantine or, or isolation, as the case may be. Um, so I think maybe that. I, I, th I, with, I think that's a little bit more complicated given that um, if we have a large number of students who, uh, a large number of staff who need to quarantine, um, what that looks like about their ability to actually do their job remotely given child care responsibilities, given home situations with at-risk folks, all of these other things, they may need to be quarantined. Like, I just think it, it could become more complex with that in terms of closing remote schooling, but that's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. My issue is I would still like to see um, what, wh how many students in a three-person or four, how many teachers in a three- or four-person team would we consider closing a grade four? So these are things that I'd like to see us plan in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and if we kind of can't plan in advance, then I'm going to renew my push to have the school committee involved um, in the in those types of decisions. Yeah. Uh, well, the, I mean, the simple answer is when you can't do it in person, when you can't. Oftentimes, what we will what we will try to do first is we will try to pivot a remote person to come in and do in person if possible, or swim, switch people around. And we have done that already this year mm -hmm. to continue the model uh, as it is. But if we end up, we, but we also ended up in, in a situation where we did not have um, teachers because they were told to stay home in a classroom, people in a classroom, because they were being tested and they had to stay home. So that pivoted to remote for a short period of time until after the testing. So that's the kind of situation when you get to a point where you can't physically staff the in-person. And I'll, I'll remind everybody that we, we have not been able to find subs to fill in. We have used subs in some situations, um, you know, but not in others. We've had to put, put even to think asynchronous instruction, but. Uh, so that's, that is in, to some extent kind of proving my, is it's kind of reinforcing my point that I think we should tabletop out what that looks like for an entire school. What does that look like at the elementary school? Where do we hit that critical tipping mass? This is more about being prepared for that and not having it be a last minute kind of decision and more have it be, um, you know, we know that if we lose X number of homeroom teachers, right? Like it's just not able, we're, it's just not sustainable given that we cannot get any subs, right? Like I do think that there's some table topping of this that can go out and that can be planned for and that can be presented to the school committee so that the community can get a sense of when these types of things might happen, when we might have to pivot entirely remote for a school. And that's gonna look very different for an elementary school and a high school, right? So mm -hmm. I think planning for, I think taking some time to, to plan for those things now, I'd really like to see that happening. So I'm gonna, thinking out loud, but I'm also gonna ask the some questions of things that we've kind of, already back and forth on um and it's and it's hard in the situation to be able to like exactly set out those scenarios we, we've tried mm -hmm. in our smaller working group um so we go from step two to step three as soon as there's one in school transmission case so if it is identified through the contact tracing that a student is positive due to an exposure that they had in school we're now moving from step two to step three and at that point, the way it's you know set up right now, Dr. Thompson and, and Seagal are, are definitely talking. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have to be involved, but so far I have been involved. So I'll put that on the table too. Mm -hmm. that if everybody wants to say that 
I continue to be in those conversations as chair. I, I can do that because I've already been doing it. <laughs> um, so if we move from step two to step three, because there's been transmission in the schools, um, part of what, you know, Seagal is proposing here is that we can bring in that state testing. And I think if we bring in the state testing, and Seagal, correct me if I'm not thinking of this accurately, um, that's going to really help us then, Joan, determine the things that you're saying. Because if you test the whole school and there's no other cases, I'm imagining we don't need to go remote. But if you do that statewide PCR testing in the school and now there's more COVID cases, that's a very different situation. Thinking about this correctly, Seagal? Yeah, the, the, I just want to add, um, if we have that scenario where one of our close contacts convert or we have some evidence of transmission in the school, a lot of us are talking, school nurses are definitely involved, school nurse leader. Um, the other thing is it, we have to have a conversation with the state epi, it's not an automatic. So um, they're going to want to know a lot of more details. Um, we're going to be advocating to get that testing in because that's a huge benefit we could get from the state to have everybody get PCR tested. I don't know if they're going to say, no, we'll only do the classroom or we'll do the whole school. Um, so there's a little unknown there with the testing, but what you described was, right. was overall that what would happen. Okay. With regard to the testing, please forgive me. You have heard this as a broken record. I don't exactly trust that the state has the funds to do that in a crunch period. I just can't imagine that in January, if we start having school to school transmission, that we're going to be the only community in the state having school to school transmission everybody is going to be demanding PCR testing from the state at that point in time. So it might come a week or two later, which will be helpful still if it comes a week or two later, but it's not going to give us the type of data that we need to make a decision to, to close a school. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that for sure. <laughs> and uh, um, the they have had a pretty good model though with the long-term care facilities um, where it's actually a contract with Fallon Ambulance that they come out and they just test everybody, staff, um, residents, um, everybody gets tested. So we've seen it work at the long-term care, even at the, you know, in the spring when they ramped it up. Um, but, but I think that is a, a big asterisk to put, because when this does happen, it'll probably be happening in many places. And this is state of the capacity to meet that need. I think right. that's a valid concern. Right. You know, and it's, and if I can go back to table topping, we have discussed how we would handle staff being out back in August. So we have a plan for how we would go through that. It's not any different than it was, you know, I mean, we might see more and the, the period of time they might be out is longer, but that's what principals have done for years when there are shortages of subs, reassigning people and doing things along that line. When it gets to a point where we can't do that, you know, it, it's not, you know, I mean, there probably are scenarios that even if we sat at a tabletop, we haven't thought of, which is kind of our constant theme in, in this situation. But, you know, the the priority is to pivot people so that we can continue with in-person instruction. And as long as we can do that safely and keep doing that, then we're not going to be closing classrooms or, or schools or what have you. And I'm hoping that, you know, with our procedures that we have in place and our and our separate cohorts or whatever, we can minimize the chance to get there. But, um, you know, it is, it is a situation where administrators have got, administrators know the staffing in their building and are going to be able to have a conversation about how they're going to make, meet the staffing requirements. And for fear of, of sounding dismissing, I'm not quite sure how, how, how the school committee would, would add to a staffing decision in, in a building. Uh, and whether we needed to pivot to full remote or not. So, Dave, I'm not asking for school committee. I asked initially for school committee to be involved in mm -hmm. the closing of the schools. And then I pivoted pretty quickly to say, we would like to know what some of those kind of policies are. And while I agree with you 100% that the principals should be in charge of that staffing, and Lord knows, everybody knows, I want those kids in school for as much mm -hmm. as possible. We all do. However, we yeah. do slide, right? we do slide into a conversation around what can we, how, how much can be achieved educationally? Can we achieve our educational goals? And there is a tension there um, mm -hmm. between achieving educational goals and, and keeping kids in school. And, and I, I am not comfortable that there is not, 
And again, it doesn't have to be firm and hard, but there should be a range available. I feel like this is the same thing as discipline. There is a range that is left that, that kind of, so that we don't have one school saying, oh, we've got two teachers out, close it down. And another school saying, oh, no, no, we can, we can maneuver some things in. Um, I think there's a range, there should, there should be a range so that there's some consistency across the district district, and parents know what to expect. And it's, there's still a ton of discretion in there for the, for the um, principals, but I'm talking about a floor. I mean, I don't think there's a ceiling. The ceiling is, you know, somehow we keep them in school all full time, but that there's a kind of base level of, okay, like we can start talking, like you can start expecting that there might be a school closing if these types of things happen. Well, I think there's two different paths here that we would be in step three. The one path is the staffing, but from a health and safety perspective, there's not additional risk in the school. And that I think a staffing issue is out of the purview of the school committee and does fall under Dr. Thompson in consultation with the goal. You know, she would be notified if we suddenly have a lot of staff in quarantine um, or, or out because they're sick. But if it's a staffing issue that is leading to the question of can we keep the school in hybrid or pivot full remote kind of seeing that more as like dr thompson with the principals in consultation mm -hmm. with the gall but if it is the health and safety now we have that in school transmission so the risk of contracting covid is different than it was still consultation between Segal and and dave absolutely but then that gets us into what are we doing how are we responding and also back to like the dusty guidance so i just pulled up again like the what I think is the most recent Jesse guidance from November 6th. I don't think there has been any since then, but it could be wrong. Um, and like most of their guidance is vague, but what that guidance on November 6th says is that, you know, if we are gray, green, or yellow, which are currently yellow, they are wanting districts to be fully in person if feasible. Obviously that if feasible is very important for Norwood because it's not feasible for all the reasons we've identified before. Um, but they only want districts to consider hybrid if you're red. The current DESE guidance is pushing against remote in almost any situation where before we, as we talked about last time, it was three weeks of red is when they wanted you to like talk about possibly going to remote, they removed that language. Now they're saying even if you're red, they want you to consider hybrid if needed. And um, sorry, I just lost the one sentence that I wanted to read to you. Um, so a uh, fully remote instructional model should be implemented only as a last resort in classrooms, schools, or districts when there is suspected in-school transmission or a significant municipal outbreak in accordance with DESE's guidance, and then they link to their guidance from the summer. Um, classrooms and schools should reopen after appropriate mitigation strategies have been implemented and as determined in consultation with their local board of health. So I think these are, again, vague. These are things we're trying to put in place. And I think, as Sagal was saying earlier, so much of it is going to depend on what happens at that time. Right. Well, I don't know if I'm going to talk about because I was going to throw a little wrench in there about that last statement that you said about community <laughs> outbreak. And so, I think, but you go first, Dr. Thompson. Okay. So, and, and just to be clear, we, we've had to pivot twice to remote in a classroom. Both of those decisions were run by me before they were made. So principals are not, they're, they're coming to me with the with the situation. We're discussing it, we're discussing it with the nurses, we're discussing it if we need to with, with the Board of Health uh, to make that decision. So it's not, so they're, because of how it is set up, so I guess the consistency comes down to me, but you know, that's, you know, and it comes down to what is in the best interest of trying to continue our education, get back to in person as soon as possible, as soon as it's safely able to do, or when we can get our staff back in to do that instruction. But we had staff that were being tested and they were told to stay home until they had the results of the test. So that was one instance in that particular classroom, there was not going to be a sub for that classroom. So, and it was all the staff that were in there. So the consistent piece for making that decision is the, the superintendent, lucky him. So no, I'll just leave it with that. But. Just to throw another wrench in there, um, mm -hmm. that last statement about significant community outbreak, I think um, we've seen some other districts around here um, 
pivot a school to fully remote because of um, you know a social gathering where they saw a significant number of school age kids that were uh, tested positive and a lot of close contacts. Um, and then they're worried about the impact of that on the school. So almost that's a that's another or that we might need to put into step three. Mm-hmm. If there's some activity outside of school that impacts the school, that puts the school at risk. Um, and those are going to have to be reactionary. I mean, we're going to be reacting to whatever that scenario is, the party that happened where we knew 20 kids were at um, and they were all exposed. You know, and, and were they in school the day before, you know, we found out or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. I do believe those decisions were made by the school committee, right? I don't know. Not all of them, no. I think it. I think it varies. Some of the districts, it was just the superintendent. Some was the school committee. Um, again, other towns aren't working as closely school and health as we are. So I think that um, most of what I've been reading about in the news has not been a collaborative decision. It's been, I, I think, largely the superintendent. Right. So the original one in, in, in Dedham was a joint decision. Uh, there were several others this past couple weeks that were not. I believe Westwood was too. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so do we need to make a motion on this or I feel like I'm monopolizing our time and I do not want to do that. I have made my point. My point is probably very clear. Do we need to make, a, should I make a motion that can then be voted upon or do we just want to move on? How, how should we move forward? Well, I think we want you know, the school committee and the board of health to feel comfortable with any changes. I mean, these are changes from what we have talked about before that is evolving because Dusty guidance is changing and state guidance is changing. Um, So we're just trying to be as clear and transparent as we can with guidance that is not clear or transparent from the state. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, That when we, if um, you're talking about a school, a whole school transitioning, um, that we bring in the chairs, the chair of the board of health and the chair of the school committee have to sit in on that meeting. You know that we pull it, we pull the two chairs in with the meeting with the superintendent and myself. And there'll probably be other people, to, honestly, at that meeting. So the classroom decisions stay the consultation between you and, and Dr. Thompson. Um, but if it elevates to a school, making sure that Ms. Bishop and I, as chairs, are involved. And then if it goes full district, that's when it comes down to the two boards meeting jointly? Is that what you're proposing? Yeah, but I feel like it's not really my role to propose that. It's a suggestion. <laughs> Joan, do you like that suggestion or do you feel not like that suggestion? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my concern is that, you know, I, I like to try to be as proactive as possible. So it's not a distrust of Dr. Thompson. So having Teresa in the room doesn't solve my concern around trying to be as proactive as possible. That's really what I'm pushing for. That was the whole reason to have the school committee be involved at all. So, I mean, I don't oppose that suggestion, but it doesn't necessarily address the fact that I just, I don't think I have the purview to make the motion that I would like to make. So, um, which is operational, which is that I wanna see some, you know, some um, proactive, like table topping out of what it has to be, um, of what it would look like for a school closing. So, um, I mean, I'm fine, but I'm fine with that. Suggest I'm fine with that motion. So I guess I will. I make Sagal's motion um, that if we get to the point of closing um, schools, that the chairs of both boards um, are involved in that decision. And I would like to make an amendment to that motion. It's my motion. So and. <laughs> Um, that the chairs continue to work together to be as proactive as possible in modeling what would cause a school closure mm-hmm. in consultation with Dr. Thompson and Seagal. Do you want me to try to clean that up, clean that up or yeah. are we good to vote on that? <laughs> clean it up a little bit just so I, Donna can get it in the minutes. <laughs> okay, Donna, I'd like to make Thank a motion. You. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here's the motion I would like to make. I would like to make a motion that um, in advance of a school closing, that Dr. Thompson, the chair of the school committee, the chair of the board of health and um, the director of public health work together as proactively as possible to develop a set of guidelines for publication as soon as possible. Can I make that motion? Yeah. Is there a second on Joan's motion? I will happily second that. Okay, further discussion on that motion. Okay, all in favor? 
Okay. So, Gal, would you update that document for us to reflect this additional step? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Maya. So, um, a couple of questions, um, not about what we just discussed, but about um, about COVID in schools. So, one is, um, I know that that um, graphic that uh, talks about the state criteria that you had shared, Sagal, I know that's on the town website. Um, is our information about the different steps um, that, that we were just discussing tonight, can that be posted somewhere on the on the school website um, so that we can share that with the community? The, the document that we have in our packets? Yeah, not necessarily the entire document, but the the definitely the like this kind of the three different the four different steps that we were talking about or and if we if that yeah. gets modified. Yeah, um, update that. Yeah, I have yeah. no problem with publishing that. So are you concerned with that? No, I was going to say just like we did with those scenarios and yeah. the other documents that we've sort of developed here and mm -hmm. brainstormed and come up with. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing I had a question about is I, I um, Dr. Thompson alluded to this, like the questions about the DESI data. Um, if you go to the DESI website and you look up data, it doesn't match what Dr. Thompson's been telling us um, because Dr. Thompson's been telling us about more cases than show up um, at DESI. And um, Sigal, I wasn't sure if you know anything about like what the criteria are for how DESI decides what to report. I know that this is not your department, but I was just curious like, how this is all working. I don't know anything about DESI. <laughs> yeah. Mystery to me. Yeah, they're, they are, they're, they're not they're really. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure I can answer it fully, but I will tell you what. So there's a case that comes across. I am required to call for every single case to report to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They ask me what grade the student was in. They ask me what school they're in, what district they're in. And then they ask whether the school, the uh, student was in school within the last week. I'm, that does not necessarily mean that they were infectious, depending on a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's what they're kind of reporting. So I guess if they're with, if they're within a week, then um, they report it in those numbers. If they don't, then they don't report them. They keep the numbers, but they don't report them as school cases. Um, so so they're, they're, they're reporting cases in schools nothing about transmission in schools, nothing about whether they were infectious in schools, nothing about whether there were close contacts, nothing about whether they need to isolate or quarantine or any of that, just whether they were, you know, a positive case in school within the last week. So it's a totally different metric than everything else the rest of the state and the world is, is reporting or dealing with. So, you know, and we have been extremely transparent with all of our cases, we will continue to be so. Um, we have been very clear with, you know, with, if there are or are not close contacts, we've we've been very clear and worked the health department, our school nurses and the and the nurses in the health department have worked closely together, contact tracing, interviewing all of these people in actually rapid form because of the close collaboration that we have to get those answers pretty quick. Right now, what is holding us up? is that we're getting calls from parents before because of the numbers are coming through the state system to the health department which then is causing a you know which way do we go sort of scenario so there's stuff that you know months ago we said well we'll we'll get it in the system and we'll contact trace it together and we'll identify well now we're getting the information because parents thank you parents are being very proactive about calling us when they get the results but that can take I don't know, Seagal, sometimes, sometimes it shows up the next day uh, in, in the health department system because of the, it depends on when the test site puts it in and then it's got to go through and find where it's supposed to be. We've had cases that we've come and, the, and, the, and, the, and they haven't come to the health department because the uh, testing site had the wrong address. You know, so it's, um, it's not a perfect science. Um, and we have to be able to adapt and overcome these challenges as they come through. So we, as soon as we hear, we're calling, calling the health department 
to, to work out a strategy to, to get on it as soon as possible. And we are very lucky uh, in that we have that relationship and have gone through those exercises back in the summer about how we would handle these things where other districts have just been figuring out on the fly. That is not what we've done. Have we encountered new challenges in this uncharted territory? You betcha. But, um, but because of, of the relationships that we have, we work through them pretty quickly. And we did in that case scenario document that we have on the website, we did think through already if the schools learn before the health department. So both of those were things that we thought about. And, um, you know, Seagal did training with every staff, just like every school staff right. um, around all of this as well. Right. And and just along those, there's there's the school decisions and then there's our, our legal obligations and orders. I mean, we issue an order to quarantine um, where we have to have, you know, the clear evidence, but there's also the school decision, which can sometimes be different. And as long as, you know, we're always working together and communicating, mm -hmm. um, you can kind of, and we say this to businesses too, you can go above and beyond. This is what we do, our legal requirement and how we control the disease and orders for isolation and quarantine. If you want to do more, you can do that, but understand that that's not our order. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I predict that I'm going to know someone's positive, you know, and perhaps depending on the population and the age of the kids, there's a higher chance of close contact, contact, but we might not be able to investigate it fully before the next day of school. So we might pivot that classroom to, to, to remote while we're investigating just to be excessively cautious. Um, and, you know, so, uh, you know, I've told you that from the get go that that's how I would approach it. And I'll, I'll continue to approach it that way. Um, you know, I'd rather have kids remote for a day while we finish an investigation in case we have close contacts than not. Um, that's not a big pivot. And we built the system to be able to do that on a dime for a reason. Safety first. So. Any other questions or concerns at this time for Sagal or Kathy? All right, so I'm not even gonna ask, when do you think we should meet again? Because inevitably something's gonna pop up and we will see you. So we will just continue to <laughs> communicate and go from there. <laughs> what are you guys doing uh, um, a, uh, um, uh, a week from Thursday? You got any plans? <laughs> <laughs> We are all eating dinner within our household. Mm -hmm. Yes, good answer. No, no, no. <laughs> yep. right. I'm gonna get a special mask with Velcro so I can get my turkey in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Sagal. Thank you, Kathy, for um, you. all your work and for joining us again this evening. Thank you thank also. You. Hi. Okay, we do have one more set of appearance this evening. Um, Dr. Galligan and Mr. Longley are here again to join us to give us um, an update on winter athletics since that area has also been rapidly changing with guidance and changes. Uh, so Hugh and John, um, thank you for joining us again. Thank you. I guess I'll start it off. So we, um, just to kind of follow up from the fall, we did conclude the fall season um, actually just yesterday. So I wanted to kind of confirm you know what I had said last time that the, you know the season went very successfully the plan that was put in place um, across the Tri-Valley League really was implemented you know well um, overall with you know certainly a few hiccups uh, in a few different areas that you know um, we could all work on and learn from you know it's it's you know listening to the discussion you know previously you know, it's a work in progress. You're learning new things daily and weekly and, the, and just communicating, um, you know, with Dr. Galligan, the nurses at Norwood High School, the families. I certainly want to thank all the parents for being proactive because really it's um, it's been them that have been in communication either with myself or the coaches or the nurse when a student hasn't felt well, you know, they've initiated that contact and that's that's been really important for us so that, uh, kids don't show up to school or practice when they've felt ill. So uh, we've been in communication with a lot of families over the course of the fall um, in that regard. And and um, I think it's it's worked out well. So I, I definitely want to thank all the families and certainly uh, Kathy and Jen, 
uh, the, the NHS nurses that have really gone above and beyond. And, you know, certainly on, you know, with the athletic side, um, you know, adding on to their, you know, just regular daily, you know, workings in, in the health office there. Uh, but we, you know, we got through pretty well. And, and I think the kids had a good experience. It was meaningful. I know I sent an email to the coaches yesterday thanking them. And, and I hope the kids look back on it and feel like it was meaningful and positive and that um, and successful for them, although, you know, different from the past. Um, so I know we wanted to do recognition, but since the season just ended, we're still formulating all of those things. We, we are planning on having a virtual fall awards night that NCM will air uh, in December. So we're putting that together. Um, you know, that will be similar to what we've done in the past. It'll just be virtual. Coaches will give speeches, we'll give out the awards. Um, NCM's Brian Dunn, who I know is with us tonight, puts together a highlight video. So, so that will be very similar to the to what we've done in the past. Um, as far as the winter is concerned, um, you know everything is still, you know, we're, we're closing in on the winter season. I think just just to give you a brief timeline as to you know where all of this began and where we are right now. Um, the EEA put out their their new guidelines for for winter sports on I think it was Friday, November sixth, and so uh, they put those out. And then what's happened since then is um, at the MIAA level, each each sport has a sport committee uh, that that really uh, you know meets probably four to six times a year typically, and in the last six months they're meeting almost weekly. Uh, so those committees all met last week uh, for winter sports and, uh, you know, reviewed the, the guidelines from EEA and came up with recommendations uh, for the MIAA Sports Medicine Committee. So all of the um, individual sport committees met, came up with recommendations, and they met with the MIAA Sports Medicine Committee on Monday and also some some yesterday as well. And then the sports medicine committee, you know, there's a back and forth there. And if, if they're not happy with, you know, some of the recommendations, they ask for changes and updates. And then they they in turn um, approve those recommendations with maybe as is or with modifications. Then today, the, the sports medicine committee uh, takes those proposals and, and makes a recommendation to the MIAA COVID task force. And so that happened today. And then the COVID task force um, will present the, the total winter sports recommendation to the MIAA board of directors this Friday uh, for approval. So we, we should know on Friday at some point, um, you know, where we'll be as far as winter sports offerings and and a potential start date. Um, we were originally scheduled to start on the 30th, which was the, the Monday after Thanksgiving. That's that's not going to happen. We're probably looking at something like the like December 10th or December 14th, potentially. Um, but it could it could be further. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the MIA board of directors will do. So. We'll have to wait for that on Friday. Once we know exactly what sports we're going to offer on Friday and what the start date is, we'll put out our winter sports uh, registration. And um, I've been meeting with Dr. Galligan, um, and you know, we'll put the league has also been meeting the ads in the league. We'll put together a proposal in a similar way that we did in the fall. Um, for the TVL principals to vote on because it's the principals that ultimately Oops. Ultimate decisions on on things like of this nature, and so they will they will vote, and then eventually we'll we'll come back to uh, this group um, to let you know you know where we are and what's happening and what the plan is. Thank you. Questions on any of that work in progress from the school committee? Maya. Um, at this point, are there like plans being discussed for all of the winter sports or have have some of the guidelines been made it clear that the, the sport can't run? 
Yes. Uh, so thanks for asking to clarify. So uh, the guidelines that were put out for wrestling and cheerleading will make them th they will not be able to run this winter. Um, I also want to state that, that the guidelines that they put out also included football for fall two. Uh, so that football was approved um, for the fall two season, which would start the Monday after after February vacation. It is our hope that, you know, at some point this week, uh, the committees for wrestling and cheerleading um, will will come forward and hopefully make some sort of recommendation to possibly go to the spring. I think that's kind of the thought that's out there, but there will have to be some additional uh, communication with the EEA for that to happen. Okay, thank you. So the uh, of the winter sports and that you're still waiting to see what the guidance will be is boys and girls basketball, ice hockey. Am I missing something? Yeah. So right now it's so boys and girls basketball, boys and girls ice hockey, um, um, boys and girls swim and dive, boys and girls indoor track, and gymnastics. Um, so there still is a chance. Um, you know, potentially like indoor track, the indoor track committee had already uh, recommended moving to the fall two season because Reggie Lewis is, is currently unopened. It's not open right now. It hasn't opened at all. And I don't know if they have a plan to open during the winter season. So um, there's a potential for indoor track to be moved to fall two and also swim based on your pool situation um, could also be moved. So, um, those are two sports that we typically offer in the winter that uh, we still may run uh, depending on there's a few different things happening there as far as location, you know, having locations available to us, uh, but they could potentially move to fall too. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Dr. Galligan, was there anything that you wanted to add tonight? Uh, no, just a uh, to echo what Mr. Longley said, and, and a big thank you to to Mr. Longley, all the coaches, the players, um, and, and the families that really um, did a, did a tremendous job throughout the fall season, and I think it gives us a lot of um, hope for for that we can replicate that uh, in a safe way throughout the winter season. Um, and you know, I don't think it can be understated the balance that we're trying to find, or that um, the MIA committees are trying to find between a physically safe athletic setting and um, a healthy um, output for our, our student athletes, right? This is something that, um, while there is risk involved from a physical health standpoint, um, there's risk involved from a mental health standpoint if they don't run, right? So, um, and, and students are definitely feeling that. Um, a lot of uh, students feel their attachment to school in high school often as much as we'd like them to feel it through academics they often feel it through other things um, athletics arts um, and and that's a lot of times where they feel that kind of emotional tie-in so this is one of those examples um, so i just want to thank everyone and kind of echo that um, i would like I, I guess a question for dr thompson and the committee is um, what do you need from us moving forward and kind of what is the timeline in terms of um, what you need from Mr. Longley myself in terms of the process to um, make sure that if these modifications are approved, which it looks like they will be in some form or fashion and that over the next potentially week, mm -hmm. we will have um, a lot more information than we do now and we will likely need to move relatively quickly after that to get things up and running. So um, I guess just a question for you all in terms of what um, what do you need from us and when? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just thinking through like the DESI guidance and the metrics and everything, I mean, and, and please, Dr. Galligan or Mr. Longley, correct me if I'm wrong or not up to date on things because it continues to change. Um, I don't think there's anything currently that would have to be a school committee decision unless we were talking about 
closing, not closing, but pivoting the whole district to remote. Am I correct? That's, that's my understanding. That guidance hasn't changed to our understanding um, that the school committee, if we were to go remote um, as a school, uh, then the um, school committee would need to vote whether we could continue to offer athletics at that time. Um, there's no vote required in general. Mm -hmm. Other than that. So to clarify just what you said there, Dr. Galligan, and now going back to our steps that we just talked through with Seagal, I, guess I was thinking full district uh, remote, but I guess if the high school is remote, even if the rest of the district, so if it's your school in particular that we have voted pivots to full remote, then we have to readdress athletics. Correct. And that's what we've seen uh, with other high schools that have had situations where they've had to make those tough calls. Okay. Um, but what does everybody else think? What do you want to see from um, Mr. Longley and Dr. Galligan? Yeah, Maya. Uh, the other thing to just keep in mind is that our memorandum of understanding with um, Unit A does say that we, as we offer, you know, if we're setting up stipends for the, the winter season that we would potentially go into negotiations. Um, and so I think we would just be looking for information on you know, what does that season look like? How, you know, what are the parameters and how does that compare to what had been done in the past? Um, and that would be something, the type of information that we would need um, mm -hmm. in order to to um, meet our contractual obligations. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, so we would need that like in like a memo format or an email through Dr. Thompson and then, um, Obviously, that would be an executive session discussion, so it doesn't have to happen at a school committee meeting. We can schedule a separate executive session, so just get that information to us as soon as you have it. And uh, one uh, a second uh, somewhat related question to what Maya have just brought up related to financials and fees. Um, I know in the, in the fall we had a discussion about or, or a brief discussion about um, what the fee structure would be. Um, as Mr. Longley mentioned, once we get this information, we're going to need to move pretty quickly to get um, students registered. And with that usually comes collection of fees. Um, am I correct that we need to have a discussion if, if, um, if we were changing the fees, um, but if we were going to keep them the same as we did in the fall, it wouldn't necessarily require a separate meeting or correct me if I'm wrong. So I believe as right now, the position of the committee has been that we have not reduced or increased those fees that we kept them the same. So I would believe that as long as you were keeping them the same, it does not have to come back to the school committee. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions from anybody on winter athletics? Can you say that again one more time? I just missed the very last thing that you said, Teresa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that, you know, as a committee so far, we have not reduced or increased the fees. We've kept the athletic fees the same. Um, so what I had said to Dr. Galligan is that if they keep it the same, I don't think they have to come back to us. It's only if they're proposing something different. Good. Okay. <laughs> so any other questions at this time? All right. Well, Mr. Longley, Dr. Galligan, thank you so much for your time this evening and for all that you continue to do uh, for the physical and mental health of our students. Oh, Joan. Sorry, I do. I have one question. So given that we were just having that conversation around closing schools, um, and not having that be part of the school committee, I, I think given the fact that it, theoretically um, the high school could close tomorrow and we wouldn't meet again for two weeks. And if we have winter sports going, does that mean that those sports continue to go or do we have to come together? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. So it, again, I mean, it, it's one thing if we're talking about closing a, closing a school, the district for multiple weeks, um, you know, other districts have closed for two weeks because of uh, inappropriate parties and exposure and things along that line, that would be a different conversation. If it's a short term staffing problem, and if, if it has nothing to do with students or infections, then, then no. Um, so, it, you know, you know, As it, it currently stands now, though, we have to vote. And so what you're bringing up is exactly the type of stuff that we should work out in advance and say, yeah, you know, like, we don't need to vote. Here's kind of like the general kind of we don't need to vote or we need to advocate that in some way. That That's one of those examples of something that I would like to see us kind of think right. through in advance so that we don't have confusion about whether or not we've got kids playing basketball when we've closed the high school 
because we have multiple exposures all over the place. Um, right. So that's that is just an example of kind of what I of the type of thing I'd like to see us work on in advance. To me, right. if it's a staffing issue, it doesn't make sense to close um, athletics, right? right. Great, wonderful. But, you know, if we've got kids who, you know, we've got multiple exposures, then yeah, maybe we are talking about it. Right. Um, so I just think some of the stuff can be worked out in advance. That's all. Right. And as you know, and, and we did have a classroom closure. What last week, I don't even know at this point, but you know, there, there was an email that went out to the school committee explaining why we had to do that. Um, so that would continue, you know, anytime we have an exciting event, <laughs> You know, I, 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 you know, and again, my, my approach has been, if someone's going to ask you about it in the grocery store, I'm going to make sure you have, uh, you have the information so that you are able to, you know, to, to answer that. So if we have to close and if we're seeing infections, then you're, you are going to know that if it's, if it's a staffing issue, which at this point, knock on wood, I do not see being a whole school, um, then that's a, then that's a different different conversation but you know you you will be notified and, and you know told about about those situations you know as they occur um and you know I'll, I'll i'll continue to do that we have we have gone through how we would try to keep our schools in person model happening our hybrid model happening and what the different options are at the building level um, we, we did that back in August as we were designing this this program, um, and we'll continue. But if we're seeing infections in that sort of thing, if you know, and you know, I have to give much like you know John and, and Hugh mentioned, I have to give give our our kids in Norwood a tremendous amount of props, respects, and shout out. They have continued to make good decisions. They are dedicated not just to their sports and activities and such, but they're, they're, they're really showing a lot of responsibility in this community. And I would, I know it's going to get tough, but I would encourage them to keep doing that. Um, you know, and, you know, if, if we don't have those kinds of issues, I, you know, I, I don't see us being in, being in that situation. And, you know, I have, I have confidence and, and faith that our kids will continue to keep making good decisions, but, you know, and as a committee know that you will, you will be informed and you will be in, you know, notified of any of those situations of why we're in that situation i, I wouldn't you know will not leave you out there uh on a branch so uh, so I was, I was trying to let dr uh, galligan and mr longley go but now i actually have another question based off of what joan said so i apologize um so originally back in the fall the mia said that if your school was in the red at the start of the season you couldn't participate, correct? Uh, I, I think um, <laughs> with everything else with DESE and the MIAA, as as the fall moved forward, you know, and people, you know, were experiencing, you know, athletics and schools, things changed. And I think the by the end of the fall, we were at a, a point where the recommendation from DESE was that the uh, schools were in communication with the Board of Health, you okay. know, in regards to those things to, to make sure that there wasn't any clusters in schools or things like that. And that uh, that that communication between um, the schools and the Board of Health was um, really a significant factor in deciding, you know, whether or not to continue with athletics or schools, you know, and so forth. So I think that's really still where we where we are maybe yeah. uh, dr Gallagher could add to that yeah that's still my understanding i, be I believe that um as with a lot of the color coded guidance i think that that has changed with it right that was that information that you just referenced Teresa was put out when basically they were saying if you're red at all you should probably consider going remote that was even before the three-week thing came yeah. up um and and now it's a totally different scale um so I, I don't believe that pertains at, at this time, but they haven't specifically stated what it means for winter sports, yeah. um, depending on your community's designation. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen them tie in their revised metric because with the 
with our rate right now, that's the goal read to us earlier, you know, 22.2, I think she said, we would definitely be red in the old metric. Like we would be really red in the old metric. And now we're, we're still yellow. So I hadn't seen anything specific to athletics based on the metric anymore. Um, so I didn't know if either one of you did. Yeah. And that is kind of, you know, and I'm being facetious when I say wonderful part of this whole thing is that as part of we're going through this game, the rules, the guidance, the requirements, all those are changing pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, and, you know, as soon as we have a, a goalpost, someone moves it uh, 10 more yards down, you know, down the field. Um, you think back, you know, we had, if you're red, you should go full remote. And then it was, well, if you're red, wait two weeks. Then it was wait three weeks. Um, and now it's red is not red. It's it's some other color. So, you know, so these these things keep evolving you know part of that is is i would like to think based on science and 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 what we're learning as we go forward but i think part of it is also um policy um based on other factors than than science um and and that's where we get you know a little concerned which is you know when it when it becomes not fun because then you have you know, things said in a news co conference, like where everyone should be in person where feasible and no one really is defined feasible. I'm, I'm going to address that in my superintendent's report. Um, but, you know, so the, the, there's this constant change and, and stirring of and throwing out new pieces and, and changing the game a, a, as we're playing it. So um, we can say one thing, it's not boring, um, <laughs> but it is, um, I also would say you don't always know where you stand sometimes. So yeah. I, oh, go ahead, John. I just wanted to add one thing, not necessarily related, but I wanted to, you know, reiterate what Dave said and wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and hope that the, you know, community stays safe and makes good choices because that has been a big part of how we've been able to stay in school and, and play sports with the kids and the adults making good decisions. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this would have been the 92nd year we would have played Dedham on Thanksgiving. So that is in football. So that's pretty significant that we're not, you know, going to be able to play the, that game this year, but hopefully we can, you know, see them this spring. But, you know, I just happy Thanksgiving. I hope everyone stays uh, safe and healthy. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I will let the two of you go with one request. <laughs> if you do hear anything from the MIA that ties any of these decisions to the metric, um, please let me know because I yeah. try really hard to keep everything straight and it's getting harder. <laughs> right. And once we once we get that, I'm I'm you know, I'll, I'll ask John and, and you to, you know, give that to me and I will share that, you know, with the committee as part of the weekly update. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you all for having us. Have a good night. Have a good night. Okay, that might go on record as the longest like time we spent on appearances, but obviously all the appearances tonight were really important and required our time and attention. Um, but Dr. Thompson, your superintendent's report, please. Yes, we're actually going to start off with a uh, with a guest. Call. We're going to uh, we're going to give Dr. <laughs> Wyeth uh, some time. Uh, we just had finished a. Uh, a professional development day and uh, some great things going on. We're going to have him uh, speak to that, and then I'll come up and uh, come back and, and finish up. Dr. Wyeth? Great. Will you uh, present the, the few slides there, Dave? Are you going to? Uh, sure. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Great. <clears throat> Only if I can find it. There we go. <laughs> It might not be on the right slide. Here we go. Well, oh, that looks good. All right, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So yeah, I'll just give you a very quick update on our, our full day of in-service work on November 3rd. And so Dave, if you could flip to the, um, the next slide there. I'll go through uh, the three levels in terms of what they did on November 3rd. So at the elementary level, we had a speaker. I think I had mentioned this to you all earlier, Ariel Nelson. She um, is from the Collective Moxie. It's a consulting organization. And um, she uh, spoke to all of our elementary staff. We divided them up in half, half the group in the morning, half the group in the afternoon. And um, the topic was working effectively with marginalized students and families through culturally responsive teaching. Uh, 
And this is the first part of a two-part series. And as it says down further on the slide, the second part will happen on January 4th as, a, as sort of the follow-up to this um, first part. Um, and the objectives there you can see for the workshop, I, I won't read them all out loud. I'll just give you a minute to sort of look them over and hopefully the audience can see that as well. Um, those are the four objectives. And she didn't quite get through all of this agenda. I, so some of that will be picked up, you know, those latter bullets will be picked up at the beginning of the next agenda. But the feedback um, from staff was, ranged from good to excellent. So I think the people really um, appreciated Ariel's expertise, knowledge, and, and responsiveness to some of their questions. Um, she really knows her stuff. And it was, I think, a, a very informative workshop, which you know, we're looking forward to the follow-up. And then, um, as is true with, with these other two, um, events, we'll be working with the administrative staff to figure out how can we really sustain this work beyond just this, you know, this year. Um, so it, uh, go ahead to the, to the middle school there, Dave. Um, you can, yeah. So at the Coakley, Margo sort of created her own little uh, Pear Deck presentation, which uh, was very well done and effective. I sat in on, on uh, that and in part. And what she did is she embedded an article in, in her Pear Deck and some webinars and videos. And she had her staff break up into groups and discuss the article, view the webinars, and have conversations around uh, what they got out of those, um, those um, tools and what impact you know, it might have on their practice. Um, part of that work was you know, going to the um, Harvard's Project Implicit, where they could take a quick little survey to test their own biases out. And the article was written by uh, Gwen Bass and Michael Lawrence Riddell on culturally responsive teaching and UDL. So the, the real theme or topic, as it says there, is, was trying to blend the work that the Coakley had done earlier around culturally responsive teaching. This has been sort of a long-term project of theirs with the new work that they um, learned on um, the previous in-service day around universal design for, for learning, which the, we abbreviate as UDL. So there are a lot of you know, abbreviations in education and we're just continuing to add to them here with um, UDL and CRT, but you'll be hearing those, those um, more going forward in, into the future. Uh, so that too was sort of a three hour morning session. Um, and the objectives of that work was to review the work done, as I said, from last year and blend it into the new learning. And to, uh, she left the staff with asking them to identify one thing that they can do in a future lesson to make it more culturally relevant. So hopefully they all walked away with one thing they were gonna try with their kids and their, their um, curriculum. Um, to uh, sort of move that work forward in, in a very real concrete way. Um, and the other part of the day was spent with mandatory reporting, a seminar that was run by the Norfolk County. Um, and again, the feedback um, for both of these you know, uh, half days was good to excellent uh, from the staff. Um, and the follow-up will happen during faculty meetings and on January 4th when the middle school will work with the Massachusetts Partnership for Youth on creating an anti-racist classroom. This will be sort of the topic, and that will tie into all of the, the work around UDL and CDRT. So I think we're hitting this, this from a number of angles that hopefully will have um, a lasting impact. Um, so let's check to the high school. At the high school, um, they had two trainers, um, Danica, Manso Brown and Phil Fogelson from the Anti-Defamation League. Um, this too is sort of an ongoing effort at the high school and actually started back in, in um, uh, yeah, 1917 with um, Jonathan Bourne, if you recall, he sort of brought, started that work with the ADL. And so this World of Difference workshop on understanding, focused on understanding the language of bias um, creating brave spaces for discussion on social justice and injustice, talking about Black Lives Matter and curriculum and the perpetuation of a 
of systemic racism. Uh, again, I don't think they got to the latter part of that in, in their workshop, at least I didn't, I wasn't present for that. And that might be something that they pick up on in the subsequent training on January 4th, where they'll be doing another three hour session with ADL. And you can quickly take a peek at the, the objectives there for, um, uh, okay, yeah, for the, do you all see that pin tab in the middle of your screen? I think, no. Okay, uh, maybe it's just me. It's, um, understand the various um, isms and how they affect us and others, and a deeper analysis of implicit bias and white privilege. That's something that was a little repetitive for some folks because, as I said, we had started this work earlier uh, in previous years, but repetitions can be a, a reinforcing thing and um, not a bad thing at all, especially given the topic here. It, it takes time to really understand uh, the true meaning of all of this. Um, increase understanding of racism and anti-racism and how to move towards being more anti-racist and not just not racist. Um, so pretty, pretty hardcore objectives. Uh, the work in the other half day was um, around the portrait of a Norwood graduate, which they abbreviate as Pong. And they, so they worked in departments to um, um, identify ways that students can demonstrate each of the five C's, which is part of that portrait of the graduate. Um, and that's collaboration, creativity, communication, critical thinking, and citizenship. And so the department is trying to figure out how can we get kids to demonstrate these things and how can we sort of capture and measure progress um, in those areas um, around each grade or course. And, um, and then they also talked about um, some of the work that uh, around UDL and how they could incorporate that into their into their teaching. Um, the feedback there too ranged from good to excellent. Um, so I think all in all, this was a, a really productive day, and it it really focused on some critical topics for us as a district. Um, and uh, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. The faculty were very responsive, uh, took it very seriously, and and um, it was it was a good day, so um, I'll take any questions if you have any, um, and I'll update you certainly as as this unfolds. You know, on January fourth, we have another half day on December eighth, um, and there'll be some work. You know, obviously work going on during that that half day as well, um, and I'll keep you updated about that. Um, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Wyatt. Yeah. I yeah. think. Um, you know, everything that you just shared with us is critically important work for our district to be doing. And I'm really proud mm. and thankful that, you know, we were able to get it in early in the school mm. year and mm. the commitment that I know everybody has to it. Um, is it possible that that short presentation goes on our website so that more people in the community might be able to have a chance to really see what we're doing with our staff on these issues? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I can, I can, put in some links to the slides that were um, presented to the faculty. So if they want to go a little deeper and there's also um, each uh, presenter um, attached a bunch of resources for people to go deeper with, with some of the topics. So yeah, we can put that on the website. Yeah. That would be great. Other questions or comments for Dr. Wyeth? All right, thank you, Dr. Wyeth. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thank you, Dr. Wyeth. So uh, just to um, follow up on a couple, of, I'm gonna actually close a tab so I don't uh, have quite so many op open. Uh, but just a little uh, update from our health services department. Uh, we are working currently with uh, CVS and Walgreens as well as Norwood Pharmacy. As people know, um, there is a requirement that every student get the flu shot before the end of December. So we're looking to host uh, flu clinics on Monday, November 30th. Tuesday, December 1st, and Thursday, December 3rd, as well as Friday, December 4th. There'll be one clinic at each of our school buildings immediately following dismissal. Registration information, locations, and times of clinics will be posted on the district webpage by the end of the week. Um, and flu shots will be available to people over the age of three. Family members and staff are also welcome. We're hopeful this will assist the school community in meeting the flu shot uh, state mandate. 
um, and obviously help keep all of us uh, healthier uh, going forward. Uh, the other thing I do want to um, want to mention, and it is actually uh, posted on the school website, uh, is the recommendations from the uh, Department of Elementary Secondary Ed and the Department of Public Health uh, around uh, holiday celebrations. And for fear of sounding like a Scrooge, um, the advice is once again to limit gathering size, uh, indoor gatherings, uh, according to the state. Um, it, uh, advisory at this point are 10 people. Outdoors are limited to 25. Um, and a strong recommendation that individuals should stay within their household. Um, for uh, lower risk celebrations, people should limit in person holiday gatherings to only people they live with. Um, and if you needed to, it should be outside and you know, keep it to people you regularly have contact with and of course to avoid travel uh, and the Massachusetts travel order is uh, still in place um, and you can see that guidance on our website. Um, so one of the questions that I have been uh, getting a lot in uh, at different times is how come we don't have a lot of close contacts. I did uh, in the schools when we have been reporting um, and I did comment a little bit about that um, earlier, but in our hybrid model, basically the way we've set it up is that kids are in school in person for two days and there's five days in between that reduces the chance of having close contacts in the school. Um, the wearing a mask, the distancing guidelines that we are following from uh, the CDC and the WHO of six feet also reduces the chance of close contact contacts and that is why uh, we did build it on the safer side um, to make sure that we would reduce um, the possibilities of transmission. Um, the other thing I will comment on is the uh, governor's um, press conference uh, a few days ago when he mentioned that you know, we should all be going back full in person where feasible. And I wanna revisit that here for Norwood. Once again, uh, we have small schools uh, with small rooms. Our high school was built with the uh, MSBA requirements, which really kind of packed the kids in. There are not extra room. Um, even if we went to the three feet guideline, which is below what the CDC and the WHO is, is advising for distance between uh, individuals, we could only get about five to maybe eight people. We would still be unable to bring everybody back in school, even at three feet. Um, my response to the governor, should he ask if he would like us to bring everybody back, he can then uh, send us the money to rent more space, hire administrators, set up cafeterias and things along that line. We'd be more than happy to bring everybody back. We also need twice as many buses, but those are other things. The guidance came back. We should be putting them in three feet. There was no release of guidance on transportation or other factors that influence how we can bring people back. And we have not seen an increase in funding from the state or federal government to do that. Um, so feasible is a, is a nice word to throw out at a, at a news conference. It is irresponsible to throw that out without giving any sort of context. So that's my um, rant for today. Um, I also want to revi remind families that this Friday uh, for elementary is the last day to ask for a model change between remote learning uh, and the hybrid model that we have. Uh, please make sure you get that to your principals. We are processing them on a first come first serve um, with the caveat that if we have a significant need for some reason, if someone was um, a high need student before and would they might be a preference there, but um, we're hoping that we will have that all done. We are going to meet uh, principals, Dr. Wyeth and myself early next week uh, to do some horse trading to see where uh, we might need to um, make some shifts either in where students go or where staff are placed in order to meet that. But that is um, the next opportunity. I just wanted to remind people of that. So uh, with that, that is the uh, superintendent's report. And uh, that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, follow up with, uh, with any member. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Any questions on any of that from the committee? Dave Patani. Uh, thank you for saying that. I mean, it is really simple to say, hey, three feet's new guidance, but it's not so simple. Thank you for explaining that very succinctly and to the point. Any other feedback at this time? 
Okay, we'll move right along. Um, so just a couple uh, shorter budget items. Um, Maya, would you be able to share with everybody the um, results of special town meeting last week? Sure, um, as you all know, a special town meeting convened last Thursday, November 12th. Um, there was the, um, the article before town meeting for additional funding for um, the schools for the hybrid and RLA models. And um, that it, that included the the money for the benefits that would be required for the new staffing. Um, uh, the questions around it tended to actually be more about um, the benefits than they were about the actual needs in the schools. But there were some questions about um, the uh, the the added staff that we brought on and the fact that they came in as long term subs and and you know whether or not we would be keeping these. Um, positions going forward and um, Dr. Thompson did let everybody know that we are hoping against hope that um, in the fall we are back to a more normal um, school model so um, we do not expect although we may find that we are able to keep on some of those um, people who we have hired you know who maybe would apply for new positions if they um, if if positions open up in the district, um, we are expecting that the long-term subs that we have hired will were just for one year. But the good news is that uh, town meeting approved that new funding unanimously. And so that was great news. And um, the capital outlay um, was also approved. And so there were some requests there that impacted the schools, such as um, some additional technology, um, um, PA systems, um, card readers, and um, things like that. So um, all of that was approved at town meeting and um, is moving forward. Yep. Thank you, Maya. Dr. Thompson, anything that you would add from town meeting? Um, no, I just want to thank um, you know the town meeting members, uh, members of the selectmen, the fin FinCom, Mr. Mizuko, uh, for all of their support. Uh, as we've gone through this very difficult process uh, way back when we had hoped that there would be a second CARES Act or the HEROES Act as it was once called in the spring and we would not be going back to uh, town meeting but unfortunately that did not happen and we were in that position. Um, we arranged this and you folks know this we we tried to be as cost effective and lean and mean as we possibly could. I think we accomplished that uh, because we had the support of the town early on. Uh, we did start our hiring process in August. Other districts did not do that. They are still searching for a large group of people. We are very lucky with the quality of the people that we found to fill those positions uh, and to have filled probably about 97, 98% of them. Again, I will say we are still looking for pairs. If you're sitting at home looking for something to do, uh, give us a call. Um, but you know, we, you know, we're very lucky and feel very fortunate to have the support of the town and, and we'll continue to work with them um, and, and use that money sparingly and, 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 ju and ju judiciously, um, you know, as we move forward. So, um, you know, as far as the technology piece, you know, again, support, uh, thank you for the town, um, the PA systems and improving those at our elementary schools was desperately needed. The card swipes are old and those are security items we would need to keep up on. Um, the technology, um, actually even back to last spring, uh, being able to use those, those um, new boards at the high schools made a huge difference in our blended hybrid learning. Um, having the uh, switches and such to run the internet to expand that, um, you know, and, and the devices it was absolutely huge to be able to start and be successful. So again, thank you everyone. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. All right, so next is um, budget transfers. I know Ms. Sheridan wasn't able to be here tonight. So Dr. Thompson, can you guide us through the two budget transfers in our packet? Yes, I will I, I will try to do my best, but filling uh, Mrs. Sheridan's shoes might prove difficult, but uh, there are two budget transfers. The first is for $12,891. This is going from uh, a personnel line uh, for administrative clerk salaries uh, into some other lines to basically cover substitutes um, in those lines. Um, so that's, that's what that first one is. The second one 
uh, is at the high school, and that is for fifteen thousand uh, dollars. That was money that was set aside to do transportation to Harvard to do field trips. Those are not happening this year. It is money that uh, we had, and we are going to use it to actually um, purchase um, some software. Um, so it is money for the um, Career Pathways program. So we're basically going to instead of driving to labs that are not open, uh, invest in software to, to move the, uh, the program forward. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Any questions on those budget transfers? Yeah. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you, Maya. Dave, is that a second? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Joan, did you say yes? I said yes. Okay, five zero, thank you. So moving along now to old business, although the first item under old business really should just be called ongoing business. Um, I'm going to add a separate category to the agenda <laughs> um, because the middle school project is going to be ongoing business on almost every agenda from now until probably 2025. Um, but Paul Riccardi kind of ruined the, the big news, but thank you, Paul, for watching, for sharing it earlier. Um, as the committee knows, we updated you um, yesterday that Alan Slater, who again is the chair of the Middle School Building Committee, Dr. Thompson and I um, participated in the interview process with the MSBA panel for the designer selection. Um, we interviewed AI3, Doran Whittier, and um, Nilla Dyer Spears, um, and AI3 was chosen. Um, so AI3, um, who is the designer from the high school, who we also worked with on the long-term um, facilities uh, project, um, will be part of our team in creating a new middle school. Um, Dr. Thompson, do you want to share a little bit more about what is going to be rapidly happening now? <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to start uh, engaging uh, early next week, as a matter of fact, with uh, with a AI3 and our owner's project managers, Compass Management. Um, so we've kind of brought back together the dream team, except maybe me. I wasn't there the first time around or the second time around. Uh, but Compass Management was the owner's project manager on the high school project, and AI3 was the architect on the high school project. So they have a long history um, of working in Norwood. Um, I have to say that their plan, um, even in a, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was not really looking at, at, at a renovation as a possibility until I saw their sketches for how they envisioned possibly kind of taking the middle out of the uh, current um, school, but leaving the auditorium and, and the and the gyms and kind of repurposing um, those. But it was very innovative de design. Um, they are focused on um, a middle school concept with a team-based um, building um, that will facilitate our, our middle school model. Um, I was very impressed with uh, their, their vision for uh, using outside, um, outside space, uh, their um, energy conservation uh, and, and energy you know, net zero um, buildings and such, and, and really making them, um, you know, a, a, you know, a green pillar of the of the community, if you will. Um, so I'm very excited to start working with them. It will be a lot of work. The first um, piece is going to be uh, getting a lot of community feedback on whether this new middle school, this new Coakley Middle School, should be a five through eight or a six through eight, um, and you know, feedback on that. And from that, we have to develop an educational plan for our facility that really captures what the Norwood schools are trying to do. And obviously Pong, our portrait of the graduate is gonna be a major piece of that and building um, the, you know, the middle of our, uh, of our district um, so that we're facilitating our projected and expected outcomes. Um, so it's going to be a lot of heavy lifting, uh, but we are definitely pleased to be uh, doing it with, with AI3. Yeah, and as Dr. Thompson said, we meet um, him and Alan and I on Monday with um, the designer. Um, the middle school building committee under the guidance of Alan Slater is going to start meeting monthly. Um, the week of December 1st, we'll meet again and then every month after that. And as I've shared with all of you before, um, AI3 and Compass will be at our school committee meeting on December 16th, and they will give us a much more robust presentation of 
all that is going to be done in the next three weeks <laughs> and, and the steps moving forward. Um, but any questions or comments at this time from the committee on the middle school project? Okay, don't get bored about talking about it because we'll be talking about it at every meeting from here on out. <laughs> Uh, so moving right along to old business, um, the next item is our school committee goals. Um, in your packet, you should see a document that I, I prepared as a draft, and this is definitely open up for discussion and edits can be made. Um, I also, on this document, um, if you scroll down, I linked to the results of our self-evaluation that you might remember that we, as a school committee, um, most of us did um, in like May or June. Um, so um, our Smith's comments are also in here, but then um, I also wanted, to, uh, now that Anne-Marie has been on the committee for a while, um, she did it as well. So there's six responses in that self-evaluation if you look at it. Um, and I spent some time going through that and I would love at a future date for us as a committee to dive into that self-eval, but I was looking at what all of us um, responded to as I was formulating the goals. Um, and I thank the other committee members, you know, for your feedback on, on the goals. Uh, Maya have had a great suggestion that we align our goals with the election cycle. So I did break down um, the goals in two sections, one from now through the end of March 2021, because there will be an election in April. Um, and then the second phase of goals um, starting April 2021 through March of 2022. Um, Dave, would you be able to maybe um, pull this up so everybody can have it on the screen as we talk through it? It might just be easier sure. for anybody following us to know what we're referencing. Yeah, I have to. I have to get it um, up as a tab first. Hang on. That's a second. Okay, I'll, I'll continue to talk as you pull it up. But thank you. Um, so again, this is just a draft, a place to start. Um, I know that there is a lot on this document. Um, but what I spent time doing was looking at our strategic planning process that is happening. I compared it to Dr. Thompson's goals, and I was looking at our long-term agenda. Um, and honestly, the bulk of this is already things that we're going to be doing um, according to the strategic plan or according to the long-term agenda. There's just a couple additional things on here that maybe we remove or, or um, adjust. So um, for the first part now through um, March, uh, we obviously have to complete union negotiations. Um, and we do have a number of unions we have to complete that with. Um, you know, as Dr. Thompson was just referring to, that middle school education plan is gonna be a lot of work. That plan does need to be um, approved by the end of March. Uh, we will see a draft of it in January, but then we do need to approve the final plan at the end of March. Um, the grade configuration for the middle school does have to be voted on by us by the end of June, June 2021. Uh, obviously, we have to develop and pass our fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, we're going to begin the policy work with MASC, which I'll talk to you about next. We do have that contract ready to go. Um, number six doesn't necessarily have to be done. This is one of those that everybody could say you're way too ambitious, why are you making us do this? Um, but it is something that Joan and I have talked about in our policy subcommittee, and um, that is creating a monthly school committee newsletter uh, just to help get communication directly to parents. Um, I put, you see my notes here, I put simple, because I really do mean simple with this idea. Um, Joan has already been, after every school committee meeting, putting an update in some Facebook groups uh, to recap our meeting. So I was envisioning just building off of that, also a way to you know link to all the initiatives we have you know going on. So that's something we can talk about. Um, the Norwood Schools Listen initiative. Uh, you know we've already committed to that. It's in our strategic plan, but we haven't really defined what we want to do as a school committee. So number seven is possibly deci deciding now for the next four months what we want to focus on, but it's also mentioned again later on in the document. Um, the school, time, school start times initiative is on here for us to discuss. We do have a task force meeting tomorrow on that initiative. Um, this is the first time we're reconvening the task force since February, because the pandemic definitely paused that work. Um, number nine, the mid-cycle check-in with Dr. Thompson. We have to do it, it's on our agenda. Uh, number 10 um, is around the mental health needs of our students and staff, so that's something we can talk about. Um, and number 11 is a question for everybody, given all the pandemic-related work that we're doing, is there anything that you want it to capture and formulate as a goal? 
So that is enough work for like a full year, but that is just the next few months. So let's start talking about those goals first. Um, feedback, other things added in, things that you want removed. Does anybody have ideas about the couple of areas where we need to, you know, kind of uh, define more so around the Nord schools listen is there something as a school committee that we want to commit to between now and March and then the other question I guess I have for all of you is around number 11 if there's anything specific to our pandemic work that you wanted to spell out Any feedback? <laughs> I think you've kind of put us all on the spot. You know, I'd like to think about it a little bit more. Um, get back to you. Okay. I mean, oh. There are some things that we've... Sorry, go ahead, Maya. No, go ahead. Uh, my comment was just there are some things on here that seem like they are, of course, we have to do these. Mm -hmm. And so I would have no problem prioritizing those. Like we're going to start negotiating. Uh, we're, we have to finish the negotiations, right? Like um, the anything related to the middle school building, um, the mass policy audit work, we have the, we've been working towards that for such a long time. Um, and once we get that, it's, that's just more like a routine and a rhythm versus a super heavy lift for us. So I'd say that that is I mean, it's still a lift, but it's not as heavy as some of the other things on this list. Yeah. Um, so I would say that I'd like to um, prioritize that as well as number nine, um, which is the superintendent mid-cycle check-in only because once again, that is something that we are committed to doing um, and we've already committed to doing. So that, that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the way that, again, I, I was really looking at a variety of, documents and things, um, we have to do number one. <laughs> uh, number two, number three, we have no wiggle room. We have to adhere to the MSBA middle school project. Um, number four, we have to develop a budget. Number five, we're signing a contract. It has to be done. Number six, again, we can talk about. Um, number seven, I just think we have to flush out more of a timeline with the Norwood Schools Listen. Maybe there isn't something specific between now and March, and then it just falls down you know, in the next timeline. Um, number eight, I need guidance from everybody because, again, we have a task force tomorrow. So if the committee is thinking you're not long, no longer interested in this initiative, I, I really need to know that before tomorrow's meeting. Um, number nine, we have to do. Number 10, I formulated a goal based on what's going to be on our long-term agenda. Um, but Maya? So I, I agree we need to talk about the Nord Schools Listen um, and I honestly have, have I know we were talking about a few different items and I, I don't know where we landed with that over the summer and so yeah um, can we recap where we're at? Yep, so there was a number of things written in Dr. Thompson's goals, some of which with Dr. Wyatt's presentation on professional development is definitely happening. So that was really great to see. Um, we had written in a timeline around a survey to go out to families and um, I linked to Dr. Thompson's goal document further down. So it is there if people wanna look at it. Um, I do think we're um, off track with what we had said. So we need to, not tonight, but soon reevaluate some of the goal setting we did for Dr. Thompson and aligning it to what we think is feasible going forward. Um, and then we did also determine that Joan was going to be trying to get some interns from Northeastern starting in January to help us with that project. But um, Joan, not to put you on the spot, the spot, I didn't ask you this before, but do you have any update on that? Um, I think we'll be able to get some interns um, by January, but we haven't, have we started, what's, where are we at with the data collection? We haven't started. Great. 
So, <laughs> um, you know, I could, we could also look at, you know, do we want the interns to really, instead of doing the data analysis, I can shift that job description to be, do you want to help build that survey and run it by? Yeah, I mean, part of a discussion that unfolded on Monday in the Strategic Planning Committee, and um, Maya and Dr. Thompson and Dr. Wyeth can speak more to this too, um, was around this work and around um, an equity consultant, and um, because an equity consultant can potentially do that survey for you. So um, I I don't know what number seven should say. I just feel like we made a commitment to something, and we don't have a clear path of what we're looking to achieve. Um, And maybe we need to, you know, again, we don't have to vote on all this tonight. Maybe we need to do some research. I just need more direction from everybody about what is or isn't possible. You know, I think one thing that we had talked about when we were first starting to think about Nord Schools Listen was to start really simply with just having um, either a link on the website or an email address or something like that, similar to how there's a way to, you know, report bullying, that there would be um, a way to provide some feedback um, related to issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So either, so it could be, you know, people, um, expressing some concerns about something that's happening in the school or expressing concerns about curriculum or you know just some some sort of way to not not a structured way to say necessarily like a survey but we were thinking about is there something we want to similar to how we have an email address for for public forum do we want to put out in you know an email inbox that we we say like this is where we're we're hoping to get feedback on this. But then I know that we also had concerns about, you know, what if some of the things that we get seem to be um, complaints about bullying or complaints about actual misconduct and, and how do we, how would we address that and who would be responsible for dealing with us. So I think that was kind of where we started to get a little bit hung up. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think that designing a good survey is a lot of work. Um, and, and then uh, obviously the data analysis as, as, as well. And then we, I think when we were talking about the survey, we had kind of said, maybe it makes sense to start with something a little bit more qualitative because we don't even know, you know, we need to start a conversation and do some like more like brainstorming type exercises before we can really design a quality survey. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know if that's something we want to think about again is like how do we get that like overall community feedback um provide a you know a place where we can collect all of that information um but but then I, I think we also kind of got hung up on the the parameters around it you know do we want people to be able to to, to post anonymously, um, you know, but then that gets into, well, what if there's allegations of, of misconduct or something like that, then how do you respond if the, if it was just an anonymous message? So, um, yeah, that didn't really help anything at all. I think I'm just thinking out loud. No, it's, it's that there's so much that goes into this, this one initiative, this one very important area. Um, just as a reminder to everybody, I did create on our Google Drive back in July, a folder specifically for Nord Schools Listen. I have not updated it recently. I can resend the link out later if anybody can't find it. Um, but in there is all the work that we did over the summer. So the very um, long quantitative survey that I drafted, um, the shorter qualitative survey that Dr. White has started to put together for us, the research that I did on this topic, the emails from our attorney that we had on her advice, it is all in that Nora Schools Listen folder. Um, so maybe um, everybody could take some time like looking through that and, and thinking about this topic a little bit more um, and we can come back to these goals on December 2nd. Um, but if anybody has feedback, um, my learning thinking writing style is best if I can hear it and then put it on here. Um, and then we could hopefully be really effective in our you know, voting some things um, if we want to spend some time doing that. Um, 
I'm also wondering now that we're talking, um, maybe a goal that we can have as a school committee maybe that we are still open is to our own professional development on this topic because the resolutions that we signed in June um, did say that the school committee would have annual professional development on implicit bias and equity and, and anti-racism. A lot of the stuff that Dr. Wyeth just shared has to do with our staff. <laughs> Yeah, Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, just just a thought. It, it might be a, first of all the equity consultant. The thirty thousand dollars is is probably not going to be available because that was in the CVRF grant, which has to be spent by December thirtieth, and there's no other grant that can pick up that kind of a cost. But it might be worth investigating a um, an equity consultant and just consult with them. Uh, or her, whoever it is, um, around the best steps forward here and to, to map out a plan. Okay. You know, um, that might be my recommendation. And again, Ron Ferguson, I think, would be a, a, a good candidate. There are probably others out there, but he's the one that <clears throat> I've, you know, know of, other districts have used before. <clears throat> And, um, you know, that might, I don't know, might cost a thousand dollars of her time, of his time just to, 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 you know, have a conversation and, and map out a, you know, a, a process for this, because it is a big task. Um, when you're talking about surveying the community, what kind of data do you want to get, who's going to analyze the data and all of that, you know, um, uh, that might be a, a logical first step that's doable. I know you had sent out an email after our meeting on Monday to Dr. Galligan, Dr. Frazek, or Thompson, and I. Um, I really need to be a doctor with all of you guys, just so you know. <laughs> How do I get my PhD amongst everything else I do? Can any of you tell me that? Um, <laughs> but you had sent out the email about trying to set up some time to look at Ron Ferguson's work and, and move this forward. So I think there's an overlap between potentially um, the school committee goal with the larger district goal. Um, so that does need to be done, I think, but what would the school committee want to formulate as like our goal, our piece in that process? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think I think it, it should be a partnership to me. I mean, it, I've forgotten who it was, Hugh, or somebody said it's not just a school initiative. This really should be a community associated initiative that involves the schools and members of the community, which would be you as representatives. Um, so, you know, I think that could be it could be sort of one and the same goal that we're working together um, to accomplish this work. Uh -huh. but, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to uh, think off the top of my head here. Yeah. Um, well, I know this is like a, a huge topic, so um, let's just review the other things, and then um, obviously we'll come back to this. Excuse me. At our next meeting. Um, but Dr. Thompson, if you would just scroll down to number eleven, um, is there anything the committee wants to formulate uh, related to the pandemic, um, or do you want to just strike that completely? I, I think we should just strike that because I don't think that and obviously we've been doing a lot of work in that area, but I, I think that we're not really in a good position to formulate a smart goal at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but with regard to the to the Nord schools listens, I think it's a great idea to to make one of our goals be that we do some professional development as a committee. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what form that would take. It might be that, you know, we we each attend, um, a, you know, a seminar or a webinar or something like that, or maybe we all attend the same one or some, or we do, we bring a trainer in. But I do think that doing that before um, the end of this election cycle makes a lot of sense. Okay. So we can think more about, you know, bringing somebody in or a webinar or, I mean, there's tons of books too that um, I think we could, you know, 
decide to read together and, and discuss the book. Um, so for now, I'll, I'll put a broader link to PD, um, and then you know I can and I encourage others to help me research what that might look like over the next couple of weeks, and then we can finalize it at our next meeting. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's just briefly review the goal period of April 2021 to March 2022. Um, so again, things that have to be done and already on the long-term agenda or the strategic plan, um, but analyzing and voting on the middle school grade configuration that was carried over because it overlaps both these periods. Um, something that we are writing into the strategic plan for um, objective one is researching and establishing long-term strategic school budget planning and sustainable grant management. And this is work that is going to be done by the budget subcommittee and then eventually come to the full school committee. So I put that there. Um, number three, continuing with the work of Nord Schools Listen. So just the next steps over that next year. Um, number four, complete the middle school override work. So once we determine the grade configuration of our middle school in June, we then have from July 2021 until town meeting of 2022 to um, really make the case to the community about why we need this middle school. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of work involved there. So that's capture number four. Um, number five is conducting and completing the MASC policy audit. Depending how the process unfolds with our policy subcommittee, it could be done by the end of 2021 if we're really ambitious um, or it could, could go into 2022. Um, number six, we've been talking for a while about wanting to have a retreat. Obviously, that didn't happen this past summer, but we could have it as a goal that next summer we have a retreat to work more on our protocols, do another self-evaluation, talk about meeting efficiencies. Um, number seven is the participation of the process of analyzing the elementary model and possible reconfiguration of the schools. Um, the timeline may need to be adjusted here, but this is something also going into the strategic plan. And I think as a school committee, we do have a very important role in that. Um, number eight, the MASC conference, we could take it off if you don't want to formalize it as a goal, but that is something for us to consider. Uh, number nine, develop the FY23 budget. Number 10, something that we've been talking about and pushed off and that came up in our self-evaluation is that we do need a new member handbook. Um, and Joan and I have been talking about this in our policy subcommittee as well. And um, we do think that the creation of this makes sense as part of the MASC policy audit. So although it's called out here as a specific product, it's really wrapped up into everything else. Um, and then I put here that it would be done by March, 2022. So that election cycle of 2022, when we may have um, one or two members, since there's two seats up at that time, we would have that member handbook completed. Um, and then we have the superintendent's full evaluation, which in his goals, we did write as between January and March, 2022. Um, number 12 is something that also has been kicked down the road. Um, the law tells us, and as I learned at the MAAC conference last year in 2019, that we are supposed to have student engagement and participation on the school committee. This is something that the Nord School Committee has never done, to my knowledge. Um, but prioritizing everything else that we have to do, and this would be a big decision, I have it currently placed that we would begin this discussion in March of 2022 with the goal that by the fall of 2022, we figure out how we're going to do that. And then 13 is a question for all of you with everything that we are collaborating with the general government. Did you want a specific goal around any of that work? So there you go. <laughs> Teresa? Yeah, Dan. Just, just a question. So I think that, you know, student engagement is awesome, but what does that look like? Are there any school committees that are currently doing that that we should be looking to model based on that? Yeah, if you... Um, look and i can send the link the folder that i created in the drive on the mac conference last year in 2019 mm -hmm. all my notes and maya's notes because she went to the conference then too we both put everything in there and there's a whole session that i attended on this topic and yeah um by law we're required to have mm -hmm. student participation on the school committee um yeah. some school committees have a student representative at every meeting um some set up like a separate advisory board um I'm not fully up on my notes from a year and a half ago, so I can't tell you everything, but I do remember no it cannot be your student council. It has to be its own thing. So some school committees set up like an advisory board. Some have it where their school 
their student school committee rep just comes like once a month and gives a report. There's different ways to do it, mm -hmm. but we're definitely not doing what we're supposed to. And Dr. Right. Thompson, I know this was something you felt pretty strongly about when you first mm -hmm. came. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is actually something I've been asking about since the end of the first year, because mm -hmm. I was surprised that there was not student involvement uh, at the school committee level. And it can be, you know, someone who is who is elected from the student body and sits on the school committee, not a non-voting member, but they participate in the meetings uh, as a as a member would, but a non-voting member. Uh, I've seen another model where you have representatives who are again elected by the student body, high school kids who come at the beginning of a meeting a month or every meeting as the case may be, you can determine that and they report out and you know, give feedback on different things. The school committee would often ask them to go around and find things out and bring things back to them. Uh, and then I've seen another model where, you know, once a month, the there's a committee of students who come forth and, and do a presentation once a month. So those are kind of the three main models. Um, there's pros and cons to all of them. Um, you know, obviously having a student voice on the committee to, to you know, participate in discussions and such is, is beneficial, but it's also tough if meetings are going till 10, 30 or 11 o'clock at night for kids to get up and get to school the next day. Um, the reporting out is, is kind of interesting. They're, they're not quite, you're not hearing as much if that's all they're doing, um, you know, and that advisory group is good, but it's only good if you're asking them to give advice. So, um, we do have, and as we've seen in Student Government Day, we have some pretty incredible uh, people in our schools. And I think having uh, their voice and, and their opinion on, on some of these discussions it would be uh, informative to the, to the committee, so. I'd like yeah. to propose that we move that. We wouldn't be able to, um, if we assess and determine student engagement participation in school committee in March, students are going out for summer vacation right after that. So I'd like to actually suggest that we move that into our summer retreat work and figure out what model we want to do then and have that be part of our summer retreat work or no. I am open to that, but I'm going to be entirely candid that I would not be able then to lead that in any capacity. I would need others on the committee to step up and do that if we're moving that timeline any earlier. My, my plate is more than full at school committee right now. Um, I see Dave every day in meetings and no offense, Dr. Thompson, but uh, well, if I didn't have- well, that, well, every day, I know. <laughs> Uh, but is that, th does the committee um, want to move that up? And um, if so, just um, so start in the summer. Is, is that what you're saying, Joan? Yeah, but I might have my dates wrong. This is going to be summer 21, huh? I was thinking we're still in 20. Um, but either way, I do think that that is something that we do not need to figure out and decide right now. And I would like to. Um... Well, so, so right now this says start in March of 2022. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I just felt like we were engaging in conversation around it, and I was like, "We're not going to figure this out right now." <laughs> no, no, no. We don't want to figure it out right now. I just no. need to know when do you all want to figure it out? <laughs> um, but Dave, so this would probably what take the um, form of a subcommittee to determine the best route of action to suggest the full committee. Because I mean, uh, I, I don't think we have discussed this in a retreat. It's kind of a decision. It's open meeting law, correct? Yeah, but our retreats are posted, and people can come to our retreats. Oh, okay. I'm thinking Catholic school, you know, retreat. We're all in a room talking about our feelings, you know, so. <laughs> no, um, no, no, no. Okay. Every, everything that we do is posted. So, uh, you know, the workshops and retreats, if people want it to come, like even all the sessions we do with Dorothy Presser from MASC, they're posted. People are welcome to be there if they Got it. Really so, listen to us hash out all that fun protocol stuff. <laughs> and I thought we were going to go someplace fun together. Oh, well. <laughs> no, we're not allowed to. <laughs> um. Other feedback or, you know, with my question for number 13, is there something related to the different collaborations and initiatives we have with the town that anybody feels strongly should be a state of goal? Maya? It's just a small thing, so I don't even think it really rises to the level of a goal on this, but I, I did remember today that we do need to, you know, revisit the MOU for the Joint Facilities Department. Mm -hmm. but. 
but that's just something we should do. It's it, I don't think it's going to be nearly as much work as setting it up was in the first place. Yeah, I do have that on the long-term agenda in December. I just wasn't sure I could talk to Dr. Thompson about the agenda, which December meeting it would be at. Yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely. Um, all right, so I'll just take number 13 off for now. Um, and I will ask everybody else to spend some time. Um, I know that I just added this to the packets yesterday. I apologize. Um, the middle school building project is a whole lot of work right now. <laughs> it takes priority over some other school committee things on my end. Um, so we can, um, it's in our packet. If you could think about it a little bit more, if there's any feedback, um, maybe by next, like a week from now, that way, if there's edits, it can go in the packet by Friday, like it's supposed to for the December 2nd meeting. Maya? So do we want to talk a little bit about the, the school start times initiative? Um, I'm generally um, supportive of this idea. I, I, you know, as we look at the timeline and consider the other things that would be going on at the same time, you know, having a, the, we'd be looking at a, a, a town meeting vote and potentially an operate a, a debt exclusion override vote in spring of 22 and you know possibly changing start times in the fall of 22 it seems like a lot going on all at the same time um but that's just my my opinion as i look at this yeah um so quick recap for all this work you know mar and i started working on it in 2017 and originally it was supposed to be voted on for the fall of 2019. Then it got pushed back to the fall of 2020. Then it got pushed back to the fall of 2021. Um, and the committee of the task force was supposed to come to us right when COVID hit. And basically all the task force work is done. Like there's so much data analysis and surveying and presentations and so much that really at a task force level we're, we're ready to go and present. Um, but with everything going on, with the fact that this is very much tied into also like a potential bell schedule at, uh, change at the high school that Dr. Galligan is working on and some other things, um, I mean, we have to talk tomorrow in the task force, Dr. Thompson, but I believe we were going to talk to the task force about now recommending for fall of 2022. So pushing it back another year, but the school committee had previously expressed, and if everybody feels different, okay, but previously expressed wanting to make the decision like the spring, like basically a year and a half in advance. So yes. we are looking to make the change September 2022. That would mean voting on it this spring. So that's where the timeline is up is as of now. Dave, I right. I, I think we might want to think about making the five to the. I feel like the the grade configuration might drive some of this conversation as well in terms of busing and and all that kind of stuff i don't know what the implications would be of changing the the middle school model um we talked about that a little bit in the task force before um anything because part of what's being looked at is the middle school shifting a lot later um again i have not looked at all this stuff in a while but from 7 20 to about 8 40. Um, so one of the discussions there about the fifth grade and the middle school is that a lot of the circadian minimum delay happens in fifth grade. So that you all know I'm hesitant about the five through eight. <laughs> I'm not fully, fully there yet. But one of the benefits of a five through eight is that if we're talking about this, it does put all of those adolescent kids on the same schedule for school. Um, the buses we talked about a little bit yesterday in our meeting with Compass for the middle school, because obviously fifth grade goes to the middle school that does change our bus run and, and how many buses we need. Um, so I think that part is true no matter what time you start the middle school. Um, but the other thing too, I mean, the middle school, we wouldn't be looking to have up until 2025, right, Dr. Thompson? I'm sorry, say that again? The middle school would not be built until 2025. Yeah. So if we did this, this would happen a number of years before any grade changes. That's true. Yeah. yeah. A lot to juggle. I know. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot to figure out. Um, personally, I put a lot of work into the school start time task force over the last three and a half years, um, and 
slightly frustrating on a personal level to see it continue to be moved, but it's been moved for the right reasons, the override and then the pandemic. Um, but I believe from what I've heard from task force members so far is that they're still very supportive of it happening. No, nobody that I've heard from says we should not proceed with the work, but we'll find out more tomorrow in that meeting. And I can, we can, Dr. Trump, so you can send out an update after tomorrow and inform the committee mm -hmm. of how the task force goes. That way everybody knows what the topic, you know, the decisions are of the task force tomorrow, and then that could impact where this goes on our goal document. Does that feel fair? Yeah, okay. Anything else on this topic tonight? Okay. So moving along, policy will not take a very long time. Hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly. But the first thing is we do have that gender identity support policy that we had our first vote on last meeting. Um, everybody heard in public forum um, the letter from Ms. Wu regarding this policy. But other than that email, I do not believe we had any comment um, from the public. Right, Dr. Thompson? Not that I'm aware of, Madam Chair. Okay. So is the committee comfortable with our second and final vote on the gender identity support policy tonight? Yes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Joan. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, wonderful. Thank you. Um, next under policy is the MASC policy contract, which we have voted on before as a committee, um, but I did not want to sign it um, until we just shared the updated fee schedule because it's been a while since we voted on it um, until we got this final copy. So when payment is due has slightly shifted and I just wanted to make sure everybody was okay with this. So the first uh, $3,500 would be due as soon as I sign it, which could be tomorrow if you all tell me to go sign it. Um, the second installment of $3,500 would be due by July 1st of 2021. And then the final installment, $3,500, um, would be due upon completion or July 1st, 2022. Um, we are currently aiming to have it done before <coughs> 2022, um, but that would be the pay structure. Dr. Thompson and Ms. Sheridan are aware of the pay schedule. They're fine with it, but I just wanted to confirm the committee is before I sign this contract. If motion to approve. Uh, thank you, Maya. I, I will second that with just the comment that like this is money well spent because updated policies will ultimately save us money and legal fees, et cetera, and other complications we could have. So this is really long overdue. So I second that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? I would like to make a friendly amendment that you signed it as soon as possible. Maya, we're <laughs> open to that amendment. <laughs> I, will <laughs> I will go tomorrow. Although Dr. Thompson will tell you I seem to have a hard time getting into the Savage Center, even though it's only five minutes away. But I will go because there's other things I need to sign to. <laughs> But we're going to have some right. Actually, here. just trying to avoid me. That's what it really. Is. <laughs> no, um, but we already do have a January meeting set up with MASC as the policy subcommittee because they need a couple months, few months to review everything. And I, pres I believe, we still already sent them all our material, right, Dave? That huge. Yes, they, have, they have all of our stuff. Yes. We're yeah. Just to send them the contract, the signed contract. <laughs> All right, so on the motion that I can go sign this, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I will do so, and I can't wait to get this started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so last quick policy item um, is two things in the folder. So the MASC um, was not able to have their full conference this early November because of the pandemic, but they did still hold an online virtual meeting. Um, I was not able to attend the virtual meeting, but I do have um, the documents from it that I shared because um, every year at the conference, they vote on a set of resolutions, and that is basically the MASC choosing issues that they're going to advocate for and focus on in the next year. And if you pull up their resolution document that I linked to in our agenda, um, there's 10 of them that they voted on. Um, two of them we have already adopted as our own um, in Norwood, uh, the COVID funding one, um, and then the um, anti-racism education. Um, but there's a resolution on here around MCAS and high stakes testing um, that Joan brought to the policy subcommittee and wanted to talk more about tonight with all of you. Um, so Joan. Sure, it's the, for, it's resolution one in the document that's linked in our 
um, packet, and essentially it is, there are two main pieces of the resolution, um, essentially saying that COVID-19 hit in the spring of last year, uh, that there were 10th graders last year who missed their 10th grade MCATs, um, and this resolution is calling for them to be held harmless for that, um, that their graduation requirements are determined by locally controlled voices of the school committee and the school admi administration, basically saying that it's not their fault that they missed the MCAS and they don't need to make it up. Um, so that's the first piece. And the second piece of this resolution is um, renewing a call for a moratorium on all high stakes testing for this academic year in light. I'd like to make a motion that we <laughs> that we approve this resolution. So you would like us to do similar to what we do with the other two, like format it as a Norwood School resolution. Exactly. exactly. Substitute the Norwood School Committee for the MCATs and um, directors. Yeah. Is there a second on that motion? Happy to second that. Thank you, Dave. Is there a discussion? Hi. Um, the the MASC resolution ends with asking the state legislature for a three-year moratorium on high stakes testing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I honestly find that to be a little bit excessive and I'm, I'm curious um, what the committee thinks of that. That's a great question. Um, committee or Dr. Thompson, Dr. Wyeth, I mean, what is, what are your perspectives at this time as well that we should consider? Well, obviously, this year is going to be difficult just based on how are we going to get groups of kids in to even do the testing. Absolutely, uh, this year. You know, and then there's, I mean, you know, the, I don't think the problem is really the testing. I think the problem is the accountability piece. Um, so if kids have had their, their education disrupted for a third of the year last year, um, marginally you know somewhat impacted this year it's still not regular school and some kids are still struggling with that are those measures we should use to deal with accountability um you know and i've never been a huge you know school-wide or individual um you know practitioner accountability measuring but i do think that it does tell us how we're doing, and it tells our students and our families how they're doing against the standards, which is really what um, it should be. It should not be, you know, a stick as, as opposed to a carrot. Um, so I think the rationale, and I was not in on the conversation, but the rationale is that three years would give it enough to come back to a normal level um, if they're going to use it as accountability. But um, I mean, I, I, I would hate to go three years without any sort of measurement whatsoever. I have no problem with having a measurement and saying we're not going to start rating schools and, and teachers and such for things that they could not control. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that already go into that that we cannot control. Um, and you can easily argue that if we could solve the poverty problem, uh, in this country and the equity issue in this country, we would solve the accountability problem in this country, but mm -hmm. that's a topic for another day. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had my social justice warrior hat on. Forgive yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I think, I think it's the accountability piece. that's the problem, but, uh, to, to not do any sort of assessment against the framework and what we expect kids is a mistake for that long a period. Um, Dave and then so I would say we make it so that we're putting this in for a, a one year, you know, moratorium on testing uh, to be revisited in a year. I mean, because I think when this is written, we didn't have the potential of a vaccine coming out, you know, in the spring, you know, so there was like three years as reasonable expectation for things to get back to normal, but we could be back to normal within a year. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere between one and two years is probably a good timeline. I think that accountability is important, but I also don't want to penalize people for being in the situation not caused by them either. So I would want to amend this resolution to uh, one to two years. Anne-Marie? 
So are we talking about, let me just clarify for myself, we're talking about proposing a resolution for the school committee, correct? Or a policy? A, a resolution. This would just, so we, we, okay. we just recently started adopting resolutions, but we as a school committee have been talking about trying to um, be more active in advocacy. Um, the MASC has always adopted resolutions, but to my knowledge, up until the two that we just did over the summer, we never signed resolutions before, but I could be wrong. Um, so this would just be something that, you know, we vote on, um, sign our names to, send to the appropriate people making the decisions, um, just to help advocate. But it's it a version of legislative happen. advocacy. What'd you say, John? It's a version of legislative advocacy. Yeah. Okay. That was my question. I mean, I was just trying to basically, uh, uh, you know, gauge what, what authority we even have in that regard, because we can make a resolution, but ultimately if the state says you're having your test, I mean, we, we can't say no. And then my, my concern around it is I obviously I advocate for this. Please do not get me wrong. I think they should be canceled this year and potentially next year, just given that the amount of um, learning that we've missed going towards these tests. I mean, as we all know, teachers have like completely changed the way they teach. Uh, before COVID to teach to the test to make sure that the kid, you know, kids could pass this, um, you know, and, and that clearly can't happen right now with the way things are. However, you know, what other implications are there? Um, are there anything further than state? Are we looking at federal issues if we don't, you know, if we don't provide these tests or if we don't, I just, I guess I'm concerned about that this might be higher even than that. So let me address the, um, sorry, if I can Hop in yeah. and address that. How I was reading, how I was reading and understanding this resolution because it's tied together, um, is when they were talking about the tenth graders would be held harmless. It was specifically around graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say this test couldn't happen. It means that if you do not pass the test as it currently stands, that you would be held harmless for graduating. And so I then interpreted, I then followed that logic through to the rest of it, which is that you can test all you want, but is that going to be impacting anybody for the next three years? Um, and that was my understanding of the resolution that I was proposing. So it's, it's more in line with Dr. Thompson's accountability piece versus giving the test. Okay, that's, that clarifies it for me. I mean, in that case, then yeah, that's, that's I, I completely agree that, you know, they should be held harmless because this is not their fault. And a gra as a graduation requirement, it should just be out the window, in my opinion, but. Yeah, Maya? I have a really different take on it. I think that, um, I do understand that the fact that the tests were canceled last year is nobody's fault, right? Like, and I'm not arguing about that or anything like that, but I do think that, um, it, I think that I'm worried that as a state, we have lost some students that and that um that we aren't giving them the education they they deserve right now and i'm not necessarily talking about nord i'm talking about larger at the statewide level and and i'm not comfortable with saying like oh that's okay we'll just leave it up to districts to decide whether or not their kids have gotten enough i think like it's important to test and find out I don't think the kids deserve diplomas. I think the kids deserve an education and we really need to do everything we can to try to bring them the best, you know, to make up for what was missed in the last few years, you know, the last year and then what's going on this year. And so um, I know that uh, standardized tests are not necessarily the best tool for this. I know that um, the, uh, it, that and I'm not opposed to like some of the alternatives for like a portfolios and stuff like that. I'm not like a huge MCAS proponent, but I just feel like, especially right now, um, to say like, oh, we're just gonna tell everybody it's okay that you missed a whole year of school and you don't even really need to worry too much about making up all that that basic information. We're just gonna send you through is kind of what I worry the message comes out to be. If we're like, oh yeah, we're just making it, you know, everybody's held, held harmless for three years. So that's my concern about it. Yeah. I think the problem is, I'm sorry, I can't write, I should be raising my hand. I think the problem is, is that the person who, the, the individual, the, the responsible party in this, the way it's currently structured is the individual student when it should be the system. Like yeah, I agree absolutely. with you. We should, and, and, and there's, I'm reading this as a way to, to hold the students less harmless. Number one, and because right now, what happens to the school system if 50% of their kids fail the MCAS, right? Like there's some punitive things that happen. 
but what happens to those students, right? They don't get their high school diploma, which basically ruins their lives. Um, it doesn't ruin their lives, but it makes their lives a whole hell of a lot more complicated. I think the other thing that happens is um, that this is disproportionately impacting um, a population of students that has either disabilities, um, 504s, or otherwise receives accommodations. And those are students who are perhaps marginally, um, who, who struggle with the MCAS anyway. It's documented that that's, that's a struggle for these students anyway. So we are setting up our most vulnerable students to be the ones most penalized by COVID. Um, and I think the ripple effects of this is going to actually last longer than three years, um, but three years does seem like a good indication. So, um, you know, for the purposes of this resolution, I would say that we could um, agree for the moratorium for one year. And then I think I could come back to the drawing board with something that um, it sounds like we all recognize that there's some unfairness going on, but it's nobody wants to let, you know, just basically say, yep, sucks to be you. We want to make sure that the learning, that the learning happens and figure out the right way to write a resolution to hold the right people, to put the responsibility in the right place. So I will amend, I'll amend the resolution to um, say that I, uh, or I'll, I'll amend my motion to say that um, I'd like to pass this um, substituting Norwood School Committee for where it says mass and mass board of directors, as well as changing the moratorium on high stakes testing from three years to one year. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we have a policy subcommittee meeting tomorrow. So, um, I mean, it doesn't sound like a whole lot of wordsmithing, but we can make sure we do that and then just get it back to everybody to make sure you're okay with those changes. Um, Dr. Thompson, has MASS put anything out on this? I mean, MASC has been pretty vocal on this for a while. Um, we talked about it um, just in the round table today. Um, there was, um, and it mainly was, the conversation was about this year, mm -hmm. uh, and the difficulty we were going to have testing in January. Um, and, you know, if the if one class came in, if the juniors came in or the sophomores came in to test, uh, would you be able to bring the other students in for the day? Um, and there was a lot of agreement that that would be, um, you know, a problem. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so that, okay. but that that was the um, that was the conversation around that. It was not about voting this. It was bringing up other issues around the um, around the uh, the issue. It was yeah. yeah. Sorry, oh, that's getting, okay. I'm getting a little tired. Sorry. Yep, we're we're almost done. <laughs> Um, the one other thing I just wanted to call your attention to in these resolutions, not for us to vote on, but just for your awareness, um, is the eighth resolution, which um, I think is really interesting. And I'm glad MAC is pursuing this, which is that um, the board of DESE um, includes a school committee member on that board um, because it currently doesn't. And the law would have to be changed for that to happen. But as we have all seen throughout this pandemic, the communication and collaboration from Dusty to school committees has been um, horrible. Um, so not that we as the North School Committee are gonna be able to change that, but I just personally um, am all in favor for MASC pursuing that resolution and just wanted to call your attention that they were trying to do so. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have a policy subcommittee meeting tomorrow um, where we will be working on all the other policies that we have talked to you about before and we'll share an update at our next meeting. Um, I don't see any new business tonight. Um, Dr. Thompson, there are a few donations. Yes, there are three donations. Uh, the first um, is from Ohio Pile Prince Incorporated. Uh, to the high school for uh, $82.74. <gasps> Excuse me. The next one is um, from uh, Bay State Textiles, and I won't go through each school, but for a grand total of $594 to the district. And uh, the last one is from um, St. Tim's uh, Thanksgiving Outreach. Uh, they have um, an collected um, gift cards for families needing assistance at Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, basically there's a total of, oh gosh. Uh, 
lots of families, 20, 30, 35. There's, uh, 90, there's 94. It says that at the end. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 94 uh, families getting, oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, $20 gift cards. Uh, the other thing I, I would mention with this and something that uh, St. Tim's normally does, but because of COVID was not able to do, um, what was uh, food boxes. Um, and what has happened is that our uh, our teaching staff and our staffs at our schools have created boxes uh, and, and done that work um, that St. Tim's could not because of the COVID situation. So I wanted to uh, recognize our staff for reaching out to our needy families as well. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Is there a motion to approve these three donations? <laughs> so moved. Thanks, Dave. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Amory. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Five zero. Um, so at this time, school committee agenda. Uh, Joan, did you have anything this evening? Um, the only agenda I would like to uh, state is I would like to state, um, or I would like to thank the building and facilities crew um, for the work that they have done in the seamless transition. Um, it we had no doubt that. Um, that joint facilities being headed by Paul and Chris would bring great things to the town. Um, but it's also impressive to continue to hear that we have 24 hour work, uh, work order turnaround. So I just want to say thank you to them and to that whole crew. Um, I also want to say that I just would like to remind the community uh, that while we are meeting um, remotely, um, we <clears throat> students have had a choice as to whether or not they wanted to engage in the RLA Academy from the beginning. Um, and that students could make a choice with no questions asked, no documentation proved, but simply what their comfort level was, whether or not they chose to remain remote um, or whether or not they chose to engage in hybrid um, and that we are continuing to follow best practice and continuing to work with the Board of Health um, around what is best practice and that is to be virtual when you can be virtual. Um, and so I just wanna put out there that, um, you know, that the RLA Academy is something um, that I am extremely proud of um, as something that the administration pulled together, that the town pulled together to allow for any student who wanted to go remote full time to go remote full time. Um, and it seems to be doing incredibly well. So I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really proud of that effort and the way the community came together to make it be a full instruction model for any student who wanted to go remote instead of simply a bunch of videos and some worksheets that they did. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, Maya, did you have anything this evening? Just wanted to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and um, we'll see you in December. <laughs> that sounds kind of scary. <laughs> uh, Dave Batania. Sure thing. So uh, as this is our last meeting before Thanksgiving, I would like to extend my profound thanks to my colleagues on the school committee, as well as Maura Smith, who was on this committee earlier this year. I am thankful for the work of the school committee, as well as the administration, our exceptional information technology department, our food service staff and management, our custodial staff, all our teachers, paraprofessionals, specialists, principals, vice principals, secretaries, and I'm likely forgetting someone, but I'm truly, truly thankful to everyone. Education is important. Math is important. Science is important. Why is it important? Well, the incredible news this week is that not one, but two COVID vaccines in phase three clinical trials seem to be 95% effective in preventing this deadly disease. A very real world example of the power of science and engineering. If you weren't already aware, one of the vaccines was developed by Moderna, a biotechnology company with key facilities right here in Norwood. Last year, thanks to tax incentives approved at town meeting by your representatives, myself included, Moderna expanded their Norwood offices, labs and manufacturing facilities. We should all be extremely proud of the small but important supporting role Norwood has played in this great achievement. A vaccine for the world may soon be manufactured right here in Norwood. Even more incredible is that these vaccines were developed in a fraction of the usual time it takes to develop a vaccine. The polio vaccine took about 17 years. The rubella vaccine took about seven years. And more recently, the HPV vaccine that prevents some common cancers took 23 years to be developed. On average, according to Wikipedia, it takes between 10 to 15 years to develop a working vaccine. Now, in less than a year, we have two vaccines that could soon eradicate the worst and deadliest outbreak the world has seen in over a century. This is no miracle. 
It is the result of decades and decades of investment in science and education. Education that started in the classrooms and science labs, just like the ones we have here in Norwood. So, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Everyone has suffered in some ways during this pandemic. Some economically, most of us socially and inconveniently, and for 250,000 of our fellow Americans and their families, quite tragically. Next week, as you consider celebrating Thanksgiving and the upcoming holiday season, as you yearn for the large family meal that looks like a nostalgic Norman Rockwell painting, please don't do it. We are so close to the finish line, getting out of this terrible mess, but we are all still in grave danger. So let's all forego getting together this holiday season to prevent the spread of COVID. Let's all fat sacrifice a little bit of nostalgia this year so that everyone can celebrate the holidays, not just this season, but for many more years to come. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Anne-Marie, did you have anything this evening? I can't follow that up. So <laughs> just, <laughs> just to say happy Thanksgiving and everyone be safe. Thank you. Uh, just real briefly, I wanted to remind the community of a lot of mental health resources that um, are on the Impact Nord website. I've seen in a couple of Facebook groups recently, um, parents sharing how hard these times are for them and their children. Um, so if you go to Impact Nord to the resource page, uh, there's a bunch of podcasts and webinars that were done over the summer and that are still being done. Um, there's also a toolkit that Aubrey uh, Seal and I wrote in the spring um, that we really want people to utilize. So please take advantage of it. And then also just a reminder that um, Norwood, the schools and the town collectively do pay for our residents have access to interface at Williams James College. So you can call them and they help match you to a provider. They figure out who takes your insurance, who specializes in what you need, um, and the availability. So um, as I think we have all touched upon in a number of ways right now is really hard. It's getting harder, not easier. Um, and it's just really important to take care of our mental health as well as our physical health. So don't forget about those resources. But at this time, oh, Dr. Ramson, did you want to say something? No? Okay. <laughs> um, so I do unfortunately have to ask the committee to go back into executive session briefly because we did not finish our conversation before this business meeting. Um, so we will go into executive session. We will return to open session just for the point of adjournment. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I do have to poll everybody individually. So, Anne-Marie? Yes. Maya? Yes. Dave Tanya? Yes. Joan? Yes. <laughs> I'm a yes as well. So, to the community, stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving. We will be back December 2nd. But to everybody else, I will see you momentarily in executive session.